Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Paris Denard, and I am the events director here at the McCain Institute. We are delighted to have each of you here uh, with us. Uh, if you could do me a favor, take out your smartphone, your iPhone, and make sure it is on vibrate or silent so that we can be respectful to our participants. But don't put them away because I want you to be active on social media throughout the course of today. So if you're not following us on Facebook or Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of these different platforms, please do so um, at McCain Institute. Uh, you can please do that. Additionally, we have a hashtag for Twitter. So on the back of your program, it says hashtag USMX Grow Together. So use that hashtag throughout today's presentations and panels. Hashtag USMX Grow Together. And for those uh, panelists who have Twitter, their information is inside of your programs. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Executive Director of the McCain Institute, Ambassador Kurt Volker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paris, and welcome to all of you. Uh, welcome to our very special guests on the panel here this morning. As Paris said, my name is Kurt Volker. I'm Executive Director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership. It's a part of Arizona State University. Uh, we're grateful to the Cronkite School for giving us space today to be able to conduct this conference here. I want to welcome you on behalf of the President of Arizona State University, Dr. Michael Crow, and also on behalf of Senator McCain and Mrs. McCain, whose family is the inspiration behind the McCain Institute. We are delighted to partner in producing this event with the Center for American Progress, and you'll see Michael Wirtz from the Center for American Progress a little bit later on. And we represent different points of view in Washington sometimes, different points of view on issues, but this is an issue where we fundamentally agree, where the relationship between the United States and Mexico is extremely important, underestimated, dominated by the wrong set of issues in our public dialogue. We talk a lot about immigration, we talk a lot about drugs and crime, we do not talk enough about opportunities, investment, economic growth, and mutual benefit for both of our countries. So we wanted to team together to put together a focus on that sort of conference, and the Center for American Progress has a series of discussions like this planned over the next year and a half, and we look forward to working together with them. Uh, in order to tee up the discussion, I want to first introduce uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Mexico to the United States, Ambassador Eduardo Medina Mora. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Walker. I'm really thrilled to be here today in this event. And uh, I would like to uh, give a very special uh, thanks to the McCain Institute and to the Center for American Progress for organizing this event. I am honored to address the audience today and to give way to the panel that will be uh, gathering the Mexican Minister of Foreign Affairs, Bob Silic, and Dan Restrepo, moderated by Ambassador Volker. I just want to convey a single idea in the very brief remarks I want to offer. This year should not go down in history as the 20th anniversary of our trade relationship. It is a strong trade relationship, but this positive yet partial perspective has sometimes contributed to our lack of awareness of what is really happening between Mexico and the United States. It should be recognized as the year in which we realize that North America is not only an idea, it is a reality. And while economic growth, market opportunities, and industrial progress are all important aspects of North American integration, the single most important element that binds us together, the United States and Mexico, is people. In our people lies our strength, our potential, and our future prosperity. The legitimacy of our states can only come from the ability to create well-being for our citizens in this particular moment. This is precisely the aim of the North American partnership. It is also by the combination of our geographies, resources, and people 
the best vehicle to achieve it. Dear friends, I am convinced that the somewhat unusual yet extremely stimulating discussions that will take place today will contribute to the single guiding intention we share, our determination to achieve peace and prosperity for our region as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. And to welcome you on behalf of the Center for American Progress, we are honored to have with us the former governor of the state of Ohio, Governor Ted Strickland, please. Well, good morning to each of you. And on behalf of the Center for American Progress, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, be with us. Uh, and we are looking forward to a very lively and unique conversation about the pathway the United States and Mexico are traveling together. I would especially like to thank Secretary Meade and Bob Zolik for traveling to Phoenix to be with us today and to all who are participating in this event. Their participation is invaluable to both today's event and to the ongoing dialogue between the United States and Mexico at large. Also, a huge thank you to the McCain Institute for a great collaborative effort it is not often that two groups such as the Center for American Progress and the McCain Institute can come together to create a positive joint venture. But this event goes to show that sometimes bridges can be built in Washington, uh, even if we have to get out of the city to prove it. Ambassador Volker and his team have done a fantastic job in getting us all together today, and we congratulate them and thank them for their hard work. Today's event is the inaugural event in a series that CAP has been working to produce. We're calling it the United States and Mexico Moving Forward. During this series of four events that have been planned, held throughout the United States and Mexico, we hope to generate a dialogue about our two countries' shared future and to see beyond the issues that have dictated U.S. and Mexico relations for even decades. Currently, United States public perceptions of Mexico are often one-dimensional, focusing on immigration and drug policy while a much broader and long-term strategy will be needed to properly understand the complex challenges that face this deeply integrated relationship for decades to come. In her 2013 book, Shannon O'Neill wrote, the news that is not reported is of a hopeful Mexico with a globally competitive economy, a rising middle class, and increasingly influential pro-democracy voters. It is also a Mexico whose people, communities, companies, and commerce are inextricably tied to the United States. O'Neill warns that it is past time for the United States to forge a new relationship with its southern neighbor. In no uncertain terms, our future depends upon it. So while today's panels will focus on the economic ties and the future of the United States and Mexico, our next event in Mexico City will focus on the growing influence of Mexican Americans in the United States and how Mexico may be able to harness that power. The final two events to be held in Washington and Tijuana will focus on how the United States has neglected this relationship with our southern neighbor and on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, respectively. We hope that you will be able to join us in person or online for these events. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Quick word about the organization today. We're going to begin now with a panel discussion on the broad U.S.-Mexico relationship. We'll then have a presentation at the lunch break 
by professors from Arizona State University from the Carey School of Business, uh, Dennis Hoffman and Anthony Evans, who have built a general equilibrium model, a visualization model of the U.S.-Mexico economy, which can serve as a tool for policymakers to look at the impact of different policy decisions. We'll be showing that to you, and we look to develop that further, and we can talk about that. And then we'll have one further panel in the afternoon looking at the economic relationship and the policy options available. Uh, with that, I want to turn to our first panel. It is a very distinguished panel. We are delighted to have with us this group here. Uh, I will start by introducing the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs of Mexico, uh, Jose Antonio Meade. Uh, Secretary Meade previously served as a Minister for, or Secretary of Finance and Public Credit before assuming his current duties. We have at the far end, uh, Robert Zellick, uh, I, I, many, many years ago, was a staff assistant for Mr. Zellick back in the State Department. And since then, he has gone on to great things, <laughs> which is uh, to have served as the President of the World Bank, as the Deputy Secretary of State. And prior to that, and very relevant to today's discussion, the U.S. Trade Representative, and even during his days at the State Department, working with then USTR Carla Hills, was instrumental in, in uh, preparing the way for a successful conclusion to the NAFTA agreement. And in the middle, we have Dan Restrepo. Dan was a senior advisor to candidate and President Obama on Latin American affairs, serving as senior director for Western Hemisp Hemisphere Affairs in the National Security Council for six years. Uh, with that, I'm going to shift my role from welcoming you to moderating this discussion. And I want to ask you, Mr. Minister, if you would lead us off, because I think um, one of the things that I mentioned in my opening remarks was perceptions in the United States about Mexico, and driven perhaps by the media coverage of a few issues, probably obscure the reality of what we should be thinking about with Mexico today. So I wanted to ask you, the, the softball pitch, what would you think Americans should be thinking about Mexico? How, how, what, where should our perceptions be set today? Well, I think both, well, thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today, speaking at this panel and, and being invited jointly by the, the McCain Institute and by the Center for uh, Brother, the, what is it? American Progress. American Progress. It's great to share the venue with Bob Selig, who has been in his uh, many different facets, a very good friend to Mexico. And it's also a great opportunity for me to share the panel with Dan Restrepo, who knows Mexico very well. Both Governor Strickland and yourself spoke about security and migration. Those are issues that should be part of the U.S.-Mexico dialogue. We both share a responsibility in terms of security. We both want to make North America safe. And we both, in order to do that, need to work jointly together. So that means that when the U.S. talks and thinks about Mexico, security is something that should be in the mind of both Mexicans and Americans. Whenever the U.S. decides to do something, it should take into consideration that the border that we share, not just jointly, but the border that we share with Central America and with South America, is something that concerns us both and that we should both work to develop. Migration is also something that we should talk about. It's part of a permanent debate. It's something that interests Mexico greatly. It's also something that interests Mexican-Americans and Mexican, of Mexican descent that live in the U.S. because of what they have chosen to do, because of the way that they have productively participated in the U.S. economy, because of we, what we want for them in terms of security, in terms of legal certainty, in terms of being able to continue to contribute more productively with a better legal standing. So those two issues should be on the minds of Mexicans and Americans when we talk about the relationship. But we should be able to talk about many more issues. Mexico is the 14th largest economy in the world. We're the fourth largest economy in America, the second largest in Latin America. Within this generation, we will probably become the third largest economy in, North, well, in, in all of the Americas. We should be larger than Canada within the next 20 years. Today, we are the U.S. second largest trading partner. Within 20 years, we should be, even before that, the U.S. largest trading partner. 
there will be no other country in the world that will be a larger market for US produced goods than Mexico will be within a generation. So when talking about the relationship, it should be recognized that your, uh, that your partner to the south, that your neighbor to the south is a big economy, it's growing, it has a large uh, middle class. It is an important market for US uh, goods. It's also a young country. We have the demographics today in Mexico that the US had about 20 to 25 years ago. Our average age is about 12 to 14 years below the average age of the US. So as Ambassador Medina Mora said, when looking at the demographics of North America, Mexico participation in those demographics is key if we want to continue to have a North America become very dynamic and very uh, competitive. We are the fifth largest, most open economy within the G20. As a percentage of GDP, only two other countries within the G20 are explained by high level manufacturing as Mexico is. So you have a large economy, you have a middle class that is growing, you have an economy that is highly sophisticated. You have a more global workforce and a better prepared workforce to rely and to support that competitiveness. And you can measure that not only by the quality of goods being produced in Mexico and being produced jointly in North America, but also by some other indicators. If one looks, for example, at the talent in Silicon Valley, the single most important source of talent in Silicon Valley is from Mexico. We are the, the largest contributors of talent to Silicon Valley above Texas, uh, our, our neighboring state uh, to the north. So taking all of these elements into consideration, one cannot explain, one cannot understand, and one cannot build a competitive and dynamic North America if Mexico is not part of that dialogue and if Mexico is not part of that North America. Terrific, thank you. I want to turn it now to Secretary Zellick. You've worked on a lot of these very issues the minister was talking about over your career. What do you see as the prospects for the future? Can we do more to advance trade, investment, economic development with US and Mexico? Is the American public ready to support that? Well, first, Kurt, uh, let me uh, thank you for the invitation and the McCain Institute and the Center for American Progress. I'm not sure I should thank people for reminding uh, you that you were once my staff assistant. Puts me in a special age category. Uh, and, uh, and also Arizona State University, which has uh, frankly made such an incredible mark. I mean, your president has really set a standard that uh, as someone who's interested in higher education, I am continue to be fascinated about. And it's a great pleasure uh, to uh, be with Dan and, and uh, with Jose Antonio, who, as we said, we work together in many different uh, capacities. I've always admired his uh, uh, abilities that uh, he could be sought by presidents of uh, two different parties, and that reflects the capabilities I think he brings uh, to Mexico. Let me start with this point. Um, you know, in some ways, my background for this is a little bit um, unusual. Like you, Kurt, you know, I, I've sort of operated with US foreign policy globally. So many of the people to deal with Mexico are specialists in Mexico or, or Latin America. But I've always had the perspective that um, the United States uh, has a very strong interest in its continental base. Um, and so I look upon North America in a global perspective. And so with that, let me try to make five points to answer this. First, um, what was what's very unusual is that all three countries, Mexico, United States, Canada, all have a very strong sense of independence and sovereignty. It's because of history and political culture. That's different from other parts of the world. So what I think was the striking opening of this was 20 years ago, NAFTA was an effort to try to create an integrated economy, but recognize you have to respect the independence and sovereignty of these three countries. And that was a slightly different model than you would see in the European Union, where you have a notion of shared sovereignty or frankly, a customs union. And it was a concept that North America had to fit within a changing global environment after the end of the Cold War. And I think that was a huge step for all three countries historically. I think for various reasons, some of the momentum has been lost over some of the past years, but I think there's a foundation to build on. Secondly, uh, I think 
there's a, a new interest in North America, at least potentially, and that's why compliment the Center for American Progress as, as well as the McCain Institute for starting to get some attention on this. Um, first, there's a huge energy transformation all throughout North America. We see this in the United States. You see it with these historic reforms in Mexico. It's true in Canada. Um, second, the structural reforms that Mexico is making are nothing short of earth-shaking. There will be a lot of work on implementation, but I work in the global economy. Next week, I'll be in Singapore uh, with uh, Tomasic, the sovereign wealth fund. A lot of Asians are now looking to invest in Mexico and in North America because the big story now for emerging markets, growth markets, however you want to turn them, is who's going to make the structural reforms. And Mexico is a big leader in that. Um, third, in terms of the demographics, which uh, Secretary Mead mentioned, if you look at the demographics of North America, much better than Europe, uh, obviously Japan, but also Russia, China, many. So, so the human capital resources, if we develop them properly, give great uh, opportunities. Um, then also what you see is higher costs elsewhere. So the, in the East Asian wage rates and others are changing. And finally, you know, the United States is still rare among developed economies by being at the cutting edge in terms of, of technology and innovation. That's not something we can take for granted, but that's a great, uh, huge potential. So I actually see North America as having the potential to be a new type of growth market where you have sort of cutting edge innovation in a developed economy, the United States and Canada, but also, frankly, uh, the star in terms of structural reforms in a developing market. And the question now is really how we can uh, try to capitalize that. One last point, though, related to potential. What I've watched over the course of 25 years is the convergence of attitudes, uh, Mexico, United States, and Canada, on a lot of the global foreign policy issues. When I returned as USTR in 2001, what was striking to me was my counterparts that were of the closest view about international openness were my Mexican and Canadian counterparts. And you definitely see this in the international economics area. You have people like Augustine Karstens who are sort of world-class central bankers. And the question is whether we might also, at times, start to develop this about different threats, whether they be cyber, different security, sort of health issues. Third point, and this is the reason why I hope we're all here, unfortunately, North America and Mexico have been an afterthought of American foreign policy. This is not what is seen as the centerpiece. And my own view is it's time to make North America as a continent the starting point, not the afterthought for foreign policy, and try to see how we can get at a lot of the issues that have sort of uh, been stumbling along. Now, there's a reason for this, which is, frankly, a lot of the relations with Mexico don't rise to a crisis. They're sort of, their aggravations, their challenges. Another reason is you have a lot of agencies that departments that would be considered domestic, um, but in fact, they're highly international. So how do you get that to be a synchronized, coordinated effort? And then this is why it's great we're in Phoenix. It's also a question of sort of state and local uh, government and communities and private sector. How do you make that interconnected? I'm co-chairing with David Petraeus a task force, the Council on Foreign Relations. It's going to be producing a report on this, I hope in October, maybe November, uh, that will focus on energy. It'll focus on economic competitiveness. It'll focus on security and rule of law, which continues to be an issue. And one other one we've touched on, which is the broader community kind of really starting uh, with the people of the region. So kind of my, my last point would be that I think what uh, the opportunity here is the three countries have a shared culture. It's not a common culture because they're each proud of their own individual perspectives. And particularly from the United States, one has to be sensitive to this. But what's interesting is if you look at it from a global perspective, the degrees of commonality are much more increasing compared to in the past. So the vision that I see and which I think should drive policy is you know, three democracies, almost 500 million people, energy self-sufficiency and even export capability over time, uh, an integrated infrastructure system that supports a production platform that's more than manufacturing, but is services, manufacturing, technology to help us compete globally, and a focus on human capital development, which is our real potential strength. And this gets into issues not only of the immigration, but frankly, workforce mobility and visas and a whole series of things that we could improve on that frankly could help all three countries be able to get the talent they need. And finally, 
developing a common perspective on some of the issues around the world. I would start with Central America. You know, this part of the, the country certainly knows the dangers of upheaval in Central America, where Mexico has also been increasingly attentive to this. So there would be a natural possibility for the U.S. and Mexico and Canada, frankly, to work with Colombia and Panama and others, not only on the movement of the people, but some of the fundamental problems are what are fragile and increasingly broken states. So I see tremendous potential, but the challenge will be to get the United States policy-making system to put this at the center. Let me follow up on that, because I think you, you framed it exactly right. This week, President Obama announced we're going to have airstrikes against ISIS in Iraq and maybe Syria. Uh, last week, we were watching Russia's invasion of Ukraine and wondering how, what can we get NATO to do about Russia and Ukraine. Three weeks ago, we had Russia, uh, Chinese aircraft doing a barrel roll over a U.S. Navy aircraft in the Pacific. Can we get the hemisphere on the top of the agenda? Well, I, you know, I think one of the challenges for U.S. policymaking, it's a global power. And so, and there's no doubt that there will always be events around the world that trigger the attention of the top people. But I do think that within the United States, we could make some structural adjustments so that the issue of North America fits more naturally. Um, some of this we'll talk about in the Council on Foreign Relations report. Some of it relates to things like how the NSC and the, and the State Department are organized. I frankly think it will also require <coughs> one of the very senior most officials in the U.S. government, Vice President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, based more on personal interest than it is uh, kind of based on sort of institutional setting, that becomes a champion because all of you have had government experience, and what you know is bureaucracies can become sluggish. What you need is somebody that's willing to punch and push and keep pushing these issues forward. Um, and so uh, what I then think the key would be to identify a series of agenda items and actually develop sort of follow-through action plans among all three countries that will continue to move while people are moving at the crisis. One of the challenges in the government at a senior level is you, you can't expect that so the topmost people are going to be focusing only on one country at a time. But you can build a substructure that keeps sort of moving kind of these issues forward. And just to give you a sense of the connectivity, you know, you now have Mexico as part of the uh, uh, a, a, a group called the Pacific Alliance that has Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile. This has very interesting possibilities for Western Hemispheric policy, so for Asia policy. So how can the United States <coughs> invest in these issues in a way that sort of creates a foundation for the future? And the closing point I'll make, <coughs> Kurt, and this goes back to the time you worked with me, I was in the U.S. government from 1989 <coughs> to 92. We were a little busy then in dealing with the end of the Cold War, unification of Germany, the breakup of the Soviet Union. We had the first Gulf War. We had a Middle East peace process. We launched sort of APEC. But frankly, President Bush structured the first President Bush, his administration, so he also completed the NAFTA negotiation, which President Clinton then uh, passed. So you know, this idea that governments can only do one thing at once is belied by history. That, that's terrific. Thank you. Now, now Dan, um, Bob served as a Deputy Secretary of State and Counselor in Republican administrations. You served Senior Director for Western Hemisphere in a Democratic administration. But I'm guessing there's nothing in what Bob said that isn't what you were trying to do. I, not only trying to do, I think we did in some levels. I mean, I couldn't agree more with Bob um, that and I would actually extend Bob's point, I think neither the United States government nor the Mexican government are well organized to deal with the relationship that we have uh, and to fully maximize the relationship. Um, both the US government in large measure is organized to deal with the rest of the world and there are such unique aspects to the US-Mexico relationship that transcend the normal lines, the normal bureaucratic boxes that there's a real challenge there. Uh, and also I think there are um, and I, I won't go too far on this, um, within the Mexican government, the, the mechanisms to coordinate the many moving parts of the U.S.-Mexico relationship um, aren't quite there yet either. Um, that said, um, so in my job at the White House, I was responsible for coordinating policy towards 34 countries in the Western Hemisphere. 
And in the three and a half years that I was at the White House, I visited one country in the region more than three times. So I went to Brazil three times, I went to Canada three times, I went to Colombia three times, uh, I went to Honduras for a strange set of reasons three times. Um, that one country that I visited more than three times was Mexico. Uh, I went to Mexico 17 times in three and a half years. And that speaks, and, and the, the interesting thing there was I went for not quite 17 different reasons, but I probably went and dealt with a dozen different issues in depth. And that speaks to this breadth of the relationship that actually a lot of this does exist. And there's a, there's a kind of paradox between the intensity of the relationship at a government to government level, and actually the relationship goes way beyond government to government, which I wanna to get to in a second. There's an intensity to the day to day in the relationship that exists uh, that because it's because we're so interconnected, kind of vanishes in a, in a paradoxical way. And then, and here I blame American media uh, in, in, to some degree, um, those attempts at high level interaction, those attempts to elevate the conversation in just the way Bob was talking about, disappear. Uh, the Vice President of the United States goes to Mexico, and, and I've jokingly referred to it, it might just be, well, be going into witness protection. Like he, he vanishes from, he vanishes from sight. Um, it, during, during the first term, the, the major um, bilateral mechanism was focused on security for a whole set of reasons at the time. Uh, we took on one trip, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the President's Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor, um, the Attorney General of the United States. Those people get together for a cup of coffee in Washington, and it's front page news. We took them to a foreign country, and no one in the United States covered it. Took them to Mexico, twice. Right? Um, so part of it, there's a huge public perception gap. I, think the, I, I do think the relationship gets treated at a higher level and more intensely than is seen in the headlines. That said, I think there is, there is room for higher level attention and the kind of action forcing element that helps organ, better organize the U.S. bureaucracy to do an even better job of capitalizing on a moment of an enormous amount of change that's occurring, both in the United States and in Mexico, that speak to the interconnection, right? The, the demographic change that exists in the United States today is an enormous moment of opportunity, both for the United States and for the relationship. The growth of Latinos, the growing importance of Latinos economically, politically, culturally, in every respect. And this is something that's pretty obvious to an audience in Phoenix, Arizona. It's not necessarily obvious to those who are watching us from beyond Phoenix, Arizona and beyond those places where Latinos are now much more visible. There's real opportunity there and there's real opportunity in the structural changes that Bob was talking about that are taking place in Mexico today. And how you put those together. This is an economic relationship that exists on Wall Street, in Monterrey, in the halls of the U.S. Treasury Department, in the halls of the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, in Hacienda, but it, and in gas fields, in the Eagleford Shale, where Mexican companies are drilling in the United States uh, in partnership with American companies. Um, the Eagleford Shale doesn't end at the Rio. Uh, it now, the exploration of it does. Uh, the economic relationship will continue there. The economic relationship also exists at cash checking places all over the United States and through Western Union and through the $22 billion that were remitted from the United States to Mexico last year. This is a relationship that bureaucratically is very challenging to manage because it exists in boardrooms and in Western Union outlets all over the United States and their equivalents uh, in Mexico. Could, could I just add one brief point as I I'm sure you want to get Jose Antonio on this. Um, let me give you one practical example of where North America needs a stronger voice. The United States is negotiating a uh, transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership, a, what's supposed to be an expanded type of trade agreement uh, with the European Union. I was a trade negotiator. I know how complex it is to add other parties. But I think it's a strategic mistake not to include Mexico and Canada into those negotiations 
because by failing to do that, we do not fully grasp the continental nature of the economy. So take the auto industry. Canada has an auto parts industry. It doesn't have an auto industry. Mexico has a very successful assembly industry. It's connected with the United States in design and information and also manufacturing. The type of work that the TTIP is supposed to focus on are issues like regulations and standards and so on and so forth. That would affect all three elements of the industry. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, the US took too long to bring in Mexico and Canada, and frankly, I think there needs to be an opportunity to look at that negotiation, how you might be able to tweak some things in NAFTA that are 20 years out of date. So a lot of government is kind of the technical details of kind of making sure these pieces fit in. But if you don't have a strong North American representative at the table, then frankly, when it comes time to deal with Europe or Asia or something else, it be Mexico becomes an afterthought. And so that's what we need to change. So this is interesting. So we have the two of you Dan and Bob, articulating really a very compelling rationale for much greater U.S. attention, focus, focus on the hemisphere, partnership in dealing externally with other parts of the world. Minister, if that were to happen, there'd be a big spotlight on Mexico. So are you ready for this? <laughs> as, as well as should be. One point, Dan went through a whole laundry list of agencies. The other one he didn't mention was the Foreign Affairs Ministry in Mexico. So I have no idea whether that <laughs> we should imply. I didn't mention the State Department either. <laughs> that is probably what's wrong with the U.S.-Mexico <laughs> relationship. And I should probably start wh where, where Bob ended. You, know, you have not only all of these elements that characterize Mexico that I spoke in my first intervention, you also have a democracy that is working. You have a democracy that has been able to reach agreements that have profoundly transformed Mexico. If one goes back 20 years into NAFTA, there were two things that Mexico and the U.S. had difficulties talking about. We had difficulties talking about immigration in the U.S., and we had difficulties talking about energy in Mexico. Mexico has dealt successfully with the energy issues. Mexico's position has evolved in these last 20 years, and if you looked at how much we have been able to get our democracy to do, and the type of things that we have fundamentally changed, that go from labor to fiscal to energy to financial to our political system to make a democracy work better, it is quite surprising. And there are very few issues that would not benefit from a North American perspective. We have talked a lot about trade. We have said that the US and Mexico trade more than $1 million every minute. We have said that Mexico is the largest market for 22 states, including Arizona. And yet, even in trade, where the case for a North American perspective should be clearest of all, we cannot get a North American perspective. And we have Canada negotiating with Europe, Mexico upgrading its trade agreement with Europe, and the US negotiating its trade agreement with, with Europe. So you have a relationship and a case around trade, which is very obvious, I mean, the numbers are there. It really has become North American. If you see a plane flying in the air, the likelihood that it is a Canadian company manufacturing in Mexico and assembling in Kansas is very high. Goods move across the border between Mexico and the US more than 12 times being intermediate goods before they become final goods. So there really is a North American value change that is worthy. Every time Mexico exports a dollar, we buy 40 cents from the US. So if one could choose an issue where the North American viewpoint should be obvious, it is trade, and yet we have not been able to do that. But if you go beyond trade, water management it, it would, would benefit from having a North American perspective. Infrastructure would benefit from having a North American perspective. I mean, one of our main advantages as North America is our geographic location. And if we recognize that the value chains are North American, and yet we don't invest in the infrastructure that we need to make the trade competitive from a North American perspective, we are not looking at infrastructure in the right way. Security, as we said at the beginning, benefits from a North American perspective. Yet, policy actions are taken in the US without bringing Mexico in the mix, not just from a global perspective and from what Mexico could say from a foreign relations perspective, but just from a security perspective 
and to make North America as a community safe. But one could also make the case that there will be no meaningful advances in climate change if we don't have a North American perspective. Bob commented about energy. The single most important transformative change in the world today is how the energy paradigm has moved in North America, which is precisely what makes us in, in, in potential the most competitive and most dynamic region in the world. So I would argue uh, that you would be hard pressed to identify an issue that doesn't benefit from a North American perspective, and yet, even in the most obvious ones, we are not coordinating policy. So this North American idea is not something that jumps to mind immediately when looking at the problems that we confront as a region where there would be clear advantages for us working together. Very interesting. Let me turn to a few specifics now. Uh, and let's start with energy, where we just left off. As, as you all mentioned, uh, Mexico has made some fundamental decisions and changes about the energy sector. And there have been some fundamental technological revolutions that have changed the way this issue can play out in North America. Let me start with you, Minister. What would you like to see? If you look out three, five, ten years, what would you like to see happen in North American energy production, consumption, and trade? If, if you look again at our geography, amongst the many things that we share are some of the geological characteristics. So the Eagle Ford Shell Reserve extends well into Mexico. I think that the energy transformation in Mexico is fundamentally, or it's, it's really a fundamental change for many reasons. It is not only important because of the opportunities that it opens up within the energy sector, which are interesting in and of itself. Energy is a big sector in the US, it's a big center in Mexico, so if you, if you allow for the possibility for more capital and more investment and better technology to go into Mexico, that in and of itself will help Mexico grow, it will help Mexico prosper, it will be important. But if you have a competitive energy sector in Mexico, what that can do for the economic competitiveness of Mexico and North America is huge, because suddenly you can start thinking about getting natural gas in all of Mexico states. That did not make sense 10 years ago because of the price of gas. But with the price of gas as it is today in North America, it makes a lot of sense for some states within Mexico and within the US to become much more intensive in high level manufacturing that requires competitive energy. It, it would not have made sense some years back to have the type of technological exchanges and the type of human capital exchanges. It makes a lot of sense for Mexico to prepare better engineers, even though we are already graduating more than 100,000 ones every year, much more than Brazil and Germany, because of the needs that we will have to develop this, this energy paradigm together. So what we would like to see happen is that we would take this energy opportunity, Mexico fully a part of that process, for North America to become very competitive and very dynamic at a much wider scale than we would have thought possible 10, even five years ago. Now that's pretty compelling. Bob, you raised your hand. You yeah, I was, just, I was just gonna say, uh, as you know, since we used to work together, while I like to operate at the world of strategy, I also think it's absolutely critical that people focus on actions. If you don't have results, strategies are just words in the air. So there's a, the, the critical need here is to develop a North American energy infrastructure that takes advantage of the innovation, the technology, the new finds, the policy changes. Part of that would be pipelines, part of that's grids, but then also connect this to the political economy issues. Let's all be frank here. The, the Pena Nieto administration has taken on a huge I issue in terms of Mexican politics and history. There will be people who are going to argue very strongly against this. And one of my concerns is that some of the benefits from the policy changes are going to take years to show. However, if the United States started to expand the electrical grid with northern Mexico, which we do, by the way, with Canada, and there's and in some parts of the US we do have this in California. Place, yeah. you, you, would, do. you would be able to get the benefits of lower natural gas prices that exist now in the United States to have lower cost electricity to help Mexican competitiveness in manufacturing, 
But, and you could probably do an expansion of this in a year or two. It's a, a question of getting the permits and moving the processes. But that's an example of how you connect infrastructure to politics to the notion of trying to uh, build a, a closer sort of North American marketplace. Um, more broadly, I think, uh, and Jose Antonio touched on this, this goes to the workforce issues. Um, to take the Canadian example, uh, there were people in Alberta that were saying, look, we don't have enough petroleum engineers. But when it comes time to getting them from the United States because of the certification systems and other things that were done provincial and locally, they couldn't import them. They couldn't bring in some of the talent from the United States. Mexico, because of some of the Pemex policies of the past, the new CEO of Bank Pemex said, look, I'm short of petroleum engineers. So one of the things as we think about the future of North America is to try to make sure that we go through the nitty gritty of what does it have to be done to allow, whether it's visas, whether it's mobility accords, whether it's certification systems, to allow greater mobility of some of these uh, workforce aspects. So it's, it's technology, it's infrastructure, it's people. Uh, just to add to, to what Bob was saying, I think uh, it, the kind of practical implementation both in Mexico and things that can be done in the United States to kind of leverage the U.S. energy revolution to benefit the competitiveness of Mexico and thereby com the be competitiveness of, of North America is vital. Some of that is actually occurring, right? You do have electricity transmission, uh, cr cross-border electricity transmission in Southern California you have a series of gas pipelines that are being built uh, in Texas and across the Texas and Arizona as well um, that are essentially being fed by Eagleford and will help drive down in the short, in the, in the medium to short term electricity prices in pr at least northern Mexico and begin that process. Because I think you're exactly right. Uh, a lot of China was broken politically to get some fundamental reforms done and being able to yield tangible results in people's lives. And sorry, sorry to interrupt, but just the, yeah. we could also connect this natural gas to Central America. So if we're concerned Which is about- something, by the way, that we are now yeah. doing. Yeah. Right. If, if you want to address the impact or the potential impact of North America, and some of the structural elements that have been of concern in, in recent months, like on accompanied minors, you have to take the developmental debate and this view to Central America as well. So we are in the process of connecting the grid between Mexico and Central America, and we are in the process of investing in the necessary pipeline infrastructure to get gas to Central America, so as to fundamentally change the way that Central America can develop and bring them further and closer to the type of things that we would want to be doing, so, so as to ensure that both Mexico and Central America are really regions of peace, prosperous, and inclusive. By the way, if you think about the politics, the alternative is Venezuela's support for some of those systems and what, the, what goes along with that. So it's a wonderful example of how economic interconnectivity can have broader foreign and security dimensions. Yeah. And if I could piggyback on the, the mention of politics and going back to a point that Secretary Meade was making earlier in terms of a number of areas where North American cooperation seems self-evident. Uh, if you line those up, I think Mexico right now and, North, and the North American idea and um, are suffering from how interconnected we are and how dependent we are on one another's internal politics and how broken our internal political system is today. Right. Um, if I in terms of the inability for the United States to invest in infra physical infrastructure all over the country, not just in the borders, border regions, uh, is a function of political dysfunction. Uh, and, the num and the issues that you ticked off in terms of the places where cooperation makes sense, they are eminently sensible. Uh, unfortunately, politics are not eminently sensible at this moment in the United States, and that is holding back uh, both the United States and the North American idea. Can I just say something? There is nothing small that the U.S. and Mexico can do together. So even, even minor changes in the everyday dialogue could have huge impacts. We were in California the other day. Just making the lanes reversible to cross the border and administering them in a smarter way could have a huge potential impact in the GDP of the border areas. So even things that seem small are not when you're talking about the largest economy in the world with the 14th largest economy in the world with a huge population. So even minor changes, even though we strive for the North American idea and even though we want to do all of these major things, even if we're just able to get together on how to administer the Rio Bravo water resources, 
or how to administer in a smarter way the border crossing in, in Douglas or in Nogales. Those things that might appear small from the outside because of the size of our population, the size of our economies, would have huge impacts on the quality of life and on the productivity of the North American region. Okay, oh, okay but I want to turn the question very, to you I'll be too. very quick. Um, another interesting dynamic that I think uh, is positive for the relationship is the amount of exchange that's now taking place at the subnational level. Um, we've had nine, I believe, United States governors uh, visit Mexico in 2014. Um, that's, and you have an increasing number of mayors, you have, and, and the opposite is true as well. You have, uh, I've met and with university the, deans, yeah, accompanied right, yeah. by and presidents of universities. Though that kind of interaction also helps fuel and support the kinds of small but very impactful changes that can occur in, in the bilateral relationship. And it helps grease the bilateral relationship in the sense of more people being more active and more knowledgeable of the relationship and being able to push, press on to our political system in ways that are mutually beneficial. That's right, the other okay. point I want to well, I, I want to turn a question back to you, Dan. Okay. Um, I want to challenge your statement that politics gets in the way of our making these sort of decisions and implementing them. Uh, I'm not sure that there is on the political spectrum, a real difference of views at this level of detail that we're talking about. And I think that it's more what uh, Bob said and what you said earlier, uh, which is it is focus and it's leadership and it's execution. And that seems to, uh, and that seems to be where we, we don't pay attention enough. We get distracted by you know, what the crisis of the day is and we're not making these long-term decisions. Uh, I don't think that there's a, uh, there's not much of a political argument to be had over the, all these energy issues the minister raised. Who would disagree? Not on the energy issues. I think some of the other issues that the minister has raised as being important in the bilateral relationship, uh, he noted two that we couldn't deal with in NAFTA, uh, or, or at the time of NAFTA, and one was Mexico's sensitivity on issues of energy and the United States' sensitivity on issues of immigration. Uh, well, and, but and, and, take and, that, take that, so energy, Right. Mexico did change its approach, right. and on immigration, the proportion of Mexican immigration, uh, illegal immigration to the U.S. has gone down dramatically. Right, but, but the dysfunction in the legal, the system, the, the system of immigration control movement of people in the United States is fundamentally broken, and even with reduced levels of migration from Mexico to the United States today, that dysfunctionality is a huge drag on the relationship and the kinds of economic activity that should be able to flourish would we to have a functioning immigration system. So, and I'd be, I'd be surprised if you didn't think there was a certain amount of political dysfunction standing in the way of immigration reform in the United States today. Um, so I think, I take your point that yes, there are some issues that are a question of focus. There are some other really big ticket ones that make a real big difference and I go back to infrastructure development by the United, investment by the United States um, and immigration reform that are very much hung up on the inability of our political system to wrestle with them. Yeah, I agree with you on immigration reform, which is why we're not talking about that so much. We're talking about things that we think aren't tied up in that. But let me turn your point now back to the minister, which is um, I started the discussion here asking you about updating American perceptions of Mexico. Do you think Mexico is, from a point of sovereignty, identity, openness to the world, are its perceptions such that it would welcome a closer economic and political integration with the United States? I think that Mexico has shown uh, very clearly that, that, that its values and its policies are closer to its discourse than, than it has ever been. And we have one of the largest free trade networks agreements in the world. We have one of the most open e economies in the world and welcoming to investment. We have a very good dialogue and, and one could go around the regions. Mexico is an important player in Central America. We trade with them more than we do with Spain. Mexico is doing its work in terms of the Pacific Alliance that brings together Chile, Colombia, and Peru, also countries that 
share Mexico's views in terms of trade, policy, and working uh, democracies. We work very well with Panama and, and with uh, Costa Rica. We have done and invested a lot of, of political capital and of cooperation with the Caribbean region in trying to solve its short time maritime and air transportation connectivity issues. Uh, we have worked a lot within uh, the Asia Pacific region. So I think if you look at, at Mexico today, specifically under President Peña Nieto's leadership, there are very few issues that we have not tackled. All of the fundamental sectors of the Mexican economy have been dramatically transformed in, in, in a direction that enabled for Mexico to become a more important and a more active global player. And if you see Mexico engaging with the world today, you see Mexico trying to construct a space of dialogue with Indonesia, with Korea, with Turkey, with Australia. You see Mexico engaging with what are known alternatively as creative powers, pivotal powers, middle powers. So in general, Mexico, I think, has been willing to engage with the world in, in a very constructive fashion with multiple regions of the world at the same time as we recognize that fundamentally the, the most important work that we could be doing is working to transform North America into a very competitive and dynamic uh, region. Bob, you wanted to comment? Yeah, let me just give a little bit of a historical and political perspective on this, but also make the point why it's important to set a vision for the future. When I first started to work with Mexico in the 1980s, as a general matter, if you wanted to know Mexican foreign policy position, you could find the US position and put a minus sign in front of it. Okay? Now, there was a reason for that. Okay? And the reason for that was under the old Mexican political system, going back to the sensitivities of the US-Mexican War and in the 1840s, um, and given the nature of the, pre the PRI system of that era, many of the trendy intellectuals went to the foreign ministry. And in a sense, the position of a leftist intellectual was to be anti-US, and that partly was a way of communicating the independence of Mexico, okay? That has totally been transformed. Now, at the same time, and as I said, not only on economic issues, but frankly, on a lot of political security issues, Mexico has to decide, does it have an interest in others? But Mexico is becoming a global player. It certainly has demonstrated that in the G20, and you'll see this, as I suggested, I think you'll see this in the hemispheric politics and other issues, okay? At the same time, you know, Mexico still has its own politics. It has its, that's why I emphasize independence and sovereignty. The United States has to be respectful. But what steps could one take now that furthers that process for 20 years ahead, exactly. okay? And, and I, you know, for example, I would think that it would be useful to even start sort of a policy planning talks focusing on issues of economic security because by and large, as Jose Antonio, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but you've got three democracies, okay, that have a pretty much shared security outlook on issues. And so, frankly, whether it's issues of terrorism or whether it's open economic systems and international trading systems and things that the U.S. believes are principles, I think that over time that one might be able to develop deeper types of partnerships with Mexico on this. Now, ultimately, those are decisions for Mexican democracy to make. But part of what I'm saying is it is stunning, even in my professional lifetime, to see the transformation that has happened. And we have to be respectful. There will be differences, just as there are with European countries that you represented. We don't always agree with France or Germany or Japan or Britain or others. But I think one needs to see the bigger picture here thinking about North America's position in the world in a 2050. And I'd be willing to bet that Mexico has the potential to be a much better partner than most other countries in the world. So let me uh, raise one issue that's come up in some of our current media lately, which is the prospect of terrorists crossing the border. So you have access to the United States coming this way. If we have such a common perspective on security among the three countries, Canada, the US, Mexico, is there more that we should be doing collaboratively on our common space about protecting security rather than, rather than thinking the problem is the US-Mexico border? What about the common external border and are there ways that we can help strengthen access to North America in ways to enhance all of our security? Minister? We do. 
and we have been doing it for decades. So in, in terms of this security dialogue and in terms of working towards the safety, we do good work every day. We have very good dialogue. We have very good coordination. I think it has been not just Mexico that has pushed forth for foreign policy in the US and policy actions by individual states to be very informed and to be fact-based. There is absolutely, and this is not just Mexico saying it, the Pentagon has said it, Homeland Security has said it. In, in a hearing yesterday, it was clearly stated, there is absolutely not a shred of evidence or intelligence that would support the notion that the southern border of Mexico or even beyond Mexico is a source of threat for Islamist uh, uh, extremists. It is something that we have worked with, with the US, not the past year, the past couple of years, but for many years past. Our ambassador is very knowledgeable on the subject. So the, the way that we are coordinated on, on those issues is very close, is very day to day. And, and I, we think and we would welcome the fact that we will have more, more policy debates and better coordination. It makes absolutely no sense for some of the border states to react, for example, to an accompanied minor issue as if it were a security threat or to involve politics without any single uh, fact-based analysis on that issue. And again, this is not just Mexico speaking. No? And Dan, did you want to comment? Yeah, I just I wanted to add, uh, just to reinforce what the minister just said. The, the United States and Mexico, uh, the United States, Mexico, and Canada have very deep security cooperation ties um, that work very well, that often don't work in the public spotlight because this kind of work isn't done in the public spotlight. Um, and, and there's the, the one example, and one of the most fascinating things is the specter of Islamic terrorism using the southwest border when it's never happened in the history of the United States versus the northern border where it has happened. Um, but that specter arises, and, and the one episode uh, in recent memory um, where the possibility existed, there was incredibly close, incredibly effective cooperation among United States law enforcement's intelligence community with their counterparts in Mexico to disrupt a plot um, a Quds Force related plot to potentially assassinate the Saudi ambassador in the United States um, via a kind of misguided effort to connect with a transnational criminal organization in the United States, hey, excuse me, in Mexico, um, that also exists in the United States. Um, so in that one example, it underscored that there is a lot of institutional connectivity that exists, that works on a day-to-day -day basis, and if a threat were to occur, there are the processes and relationships in place um, to respond to those. Uh, but I think it's, it, it also behooves everyone in terms of the political discourse in the United States to stay fact-based in terms of what the threats are uh, and how we can work with them because when we deviate from fact and, and the analytical basis, we complicate everybody's politics, quite frankly, here and there. Um, that makes the life of those who are working these issues more difficult and makes their cooperation more difficult than it needs to be uh, and than it must be at some basic level. Right, great. Bob? Just two observations. Um, one, you know, I think we have to be uh, forthright about challenges that Mexico still faces uh, in terms of its own institutional democratic rule of law development. But at the same time, the United States is the bigger power and the hegemon on the, on the continent, uh, needs to approach these in an issue that tries to be constructive in reflecting this point about Mexican sensitivities. So uh, frankly, you know, there's still going to be work to be done in terms of addressing the criminal networks, in working with the judicial system, in, in dealing with state uh, sort of uh, uh, and sort of local police force development in dealing with the judicial system, in dealing, frankly, from the United States side with arms smuggling and drug consumption, uh, with strengthening the types of communities so that you have resilience in a community that can deal with some of these problems. These are not small issues. The key point is 
the Mexican government is trying to address them, as did prior administrations. There are ways that the United States, or for that matter, Canada, can try to help, but we need to help in a way that recognizes that this is Mexico's ownership of the issue. But uh, I, I think that on the one hand, sometimes people turn a blind eye to these. Everybody knows, for example, with intelligence sharing and other issues, those are factors you have to deal with. But frankly, I think, again, there's an opportunity, particularly given over the past couple administrations what Mexico has tried to do, and there's an opportunity to overcome those. And what an achievement that would be. Yeah. Let me turn back to something that uh, you raised earlier, Bob, which was um, US-EU transatlantic trade and investment partnership talks, Canada, EU, Mexico, EU, and wouldn't it be smarter and maybe more rational to view it as NAFTA and EU? Um, do you think there's a prospect of doing that? And could you apply that more broadly? Should we be presenting a common front to China or to other external investors and saying, look, there's a there's an aerospace sector developing in the U.S. and Mexico that might be attractive for global investment if you look at it as a whole, or there is uh, an energy sector that might be attractive. Can we package ourselves that way? Uh, well, as for the first question, um, in very practical terms, I'm hopeful after the midterm election that the administration uh, will work with the Congress to move forward trade promotion authority. At the start of this year, you had the Democratic chairman of this Finance Committee, Senator Baucus, and the Republican Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Dave Camp, put forward a bill. This is politics reality. Harry Reid didn't want to move on this issue at all because he was afraid it would affect some of his senatorial votes. I've tried to talk actually to Senator Wyden, the new Chairman of the Finance Committee, about why we should start to even move the process forward because if the Republicans take the Senate, I would like the Democrats to have had sort of an engagement in this. There's things to bring it forward. But the practical reality is someone's got to pass TPA. Uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific, is further along. I would hope the starting point would be that the U.S., Mexican, and Canadian negotiators look for some opportunities to upgrade NAFTA through the TPP process. Remember, of the 12 countries in the Trans-Pacific negotiation, so U.S. and 11 others, we already have free trade agreements with six of those. Okay, so, so this is primarily adding Japan, Vietnam, and Malaysia, and so let's also use this as an opportunity to kind of fix some things that need to get fixed. The transatlantic, frankly, is in deep trouble. I have to tell you very frankly, now you're gonna have a new trade commissioner uh, that was just sort of appointed. Uh, after the midterm elections, we're gonna have to regain momentum. My honest sense, and this doesn't, I, mean, I like Mike Froman, I respect him. I'm afraid he's not really interested in adding Canada and Mexico. I think that's a mistake for the reasons that I said, okay? Um, the broader issue that you mentioned is one that I think is very, very important. And again, from the perspective of the World Bank or G20 or others, uh, I can't tell you the number of times where you could sense that the Mexican, U.S. sort of Canadian convergence of position uh, was, was just, uh, kind of apparent, implicit. It was sort of the nature of how they sort of viewed the world. And there is definitely the prospect now of trying to capture some of these benefits of North America in a globally competitive context. I'll give you a very practical example. When I was at the World Bank, there's an arm called IFC, private sector arm. Uh, I created an asset management company that would allow others to invest in our private investment projects. And we created a first fund for Africa and Latin America. That, that AMC has just created a Mexico investment fund. And the person who is helping to run this told me uh, yesterday, this came because China wanted to invest more in Mexico. And it said, you know, rather than do it directly, maybe we should even do it through a, a kind of an international system, which shows some sophistication on the part of, of China in this as well. I mentioned I'm headed off to Singapore next week. I serve on the board of Tomasic, the sovereign wealth fund of Singapore. Tomasic has an office in Mexico City. There's a lot of interest in this. So this goes to a point also that Jose Antonio mentioned that, that I don't want to just let pass. There's a heck of a lot of efficiencies that we could do in terms of border integration procedures, in terms of pre-clearance, use of technology. Uh, I've been asked by a group of a US Mexican group of CEOs that the ambassador helped host. It's the Chamber of Commerce of both. And you've got companies such as GE and others that are looking, how can we use smart technology to expedite stuff across the border? 
this project that you mentioned ASU is looking at, very interesting, because maybe it could create the databases to show with changes that otherwise might seem technical, how it can have big influence. But there's a huge opportunity here, as you think, it, we're already doing this at the level of monetary policies, because you've got very sophisticated central bankers in all three countries. But as you start to think about trade issues, as you start to think about integration issues, investment issues, huge potential. And what's wonderful about it is it's flowing naturally from what's happening in the private sector. And frankly, one of the challenges is to get the government out of the way <laughs> in terms of some of the licensing and permits or the border controls. And the last point on this factually is if you look at the data, you know, we just passed September 11th. The, the trade flows after September 11th really slowed down compared in the past. Now, there's various reasons for this. Part of it was competition from China, and you got raising costs in China and others. But the reason that I mentioned that I think there's a moment here, if you take the energy, the higher costs, the technology, the Mexican reforms, I think you could have a critical mass of events here that create a new opportunity economically, that could create a new opportunity politically between the two countries. And the key point is, how this not only affects North America, but North America globally. Right, great. I'm gonna ask whether anyone in our audience here wants to bring up other issues and questions that they have. I see one right here, and we'll start. Gentleman in the white shirt. The uh, microphone right Max there. Max Rumbaugh with Scott, uh, past president of Scottsdale Sister Cities, and I want to build upon a comment that you made, and that is, is the, how about at the lower level, what is the interest in Mexico and the United States of having better relationships and so forth? And our focus is on uh, building relationships with our sister city, as is uh, Phoenix with their sister city and so forth. So we began a process of having student exchanges in order to try to get a greater uh, interfacing between the students in our sister city and the students of Scottsdale. And one of the things that they do is they end up discussing a subject of Mexican-American relations. And what I was surprised to find that not only in the United States has in the past, or in Scottsdale, has in the past been a lack of interest, a lack of knowledge, and a lack of caring about international relations by young people in Scottsdale. But I found the same thing in our sister city down there. That yes, they admire the United States, but their interest in getting involved and knowing more about foreign affairs and so forth was very, very low level, almost matched ours. So my question is, is my comment is, is that I think the sister city organizations out of Washington, D.C. can play a tremendous role in building that relationship if you would care to carry to them this challenge that you're carrying across the rest of the world. Very good, thank you. I'd like to take one or two more and then turn Can I just back. comment one, oh, ahead, one, one piece where there's a new opportunity in this? It's just your question just jogged in my memory. I was down in Mexico City uh, over the past couple of days as I serve on the board of a company that, that ha has some major universities in Mexico. And one is the UVM, the Valley of Mexico, which has actually I don't know, 150,000 students all across Mexico. Another one is Unitech. I spoke to the students. And one of the things that they, and these are students that, this is not the top end. Uh, these are sort of middle class, aspirational students trying to develop some credentials and others. And you know what one of their biggest interests is? Was to connect internationally, to have a sense of what was going on. And the amazing possibility now is with technology. This is why I emphasize human capital development. If we get smart about looking at the human capital of North America, there are things you could do with, with MOOCs, there's things that you could do with some of the international, uh, uh, the Coursera, and part of this is understanding, frankly, we ought to have a common, you know, international or an educational development, always respecting local prerogatives, which both sides had, but, but recognize there's an opportunity here to interconnect with young Mexicans and young Americans in a global environment using new methods that are just beginning to be tapped. Right, there's a, um in the second table here, not the gentleman in the suit, but the woman behind, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Lydia Hernandez, I'm a state rep uh, here, on, currently reside on the west side of Phoenix. Um, having grown up an activist, um, growing up, you know, a Mexican-American born on, on the, uh, the border, a border town in South Texas. Um, going into, uh, and I want, I want to thank you, by the way, and your extensive backgrounds and experience that you offer to us today. And I, I just love the level of conversation uh, 
that we're having here today because I've served, uh, I also serve on, a, on an ad hoc committee at the state capitol. And very rare, I mean, it's rare that we have these kinds of conversations where we share perspectives from the economic uh, uh, um, interest that mutually are, is beneficial to both countries. Um, the, the, the level of elevation, and although I'm somewhat antsy, um, having grown up in my journey to where I'm, I am at now, I wanna say I have the answer. But how do we get, and we talked about the politics and we talked about the, the um, uh, intellectual reasoning right, as to why this benefits us as countries. But what can we do? What do we do? I wanna see some change, some dialogue, some real workings together in my lifetime. What needs to happen to get us beyond uh, the rhetoric that we see now? Thank you. Okay, and if you would pass the microphone forward, we'll, we'll go right here too. Hello, um, my name is Carlos Heredia. Uh, I am a professor at CIDE, the Center for Research and Teaching in Economics in Mexico City, uh, who will be hosting the next meeting in this series of meetings. Um, I, I wanna pick up on um, Ambassador Medina Mora's words on the fact that our most precious asset is our own people. So, um, and I want to, um, kind of look at all these issues from the perspective of the ordinary citizen in the United States and in Mexico. Because see, more often than not, we look at it from the perspective of up here and we don't really um, bring into the picture how we can incorporate the view of ordinary citizens. And in that, I wanna ask Bob Selleck, um, you mentioned that we need greater mobility and greater connectivity. And yet, labor flows are often seen in a national security slash police slash criminal framework rather than a factor to enhance joint productivity and competitiveness in the region. So I know that whoever mentions the issue of labor mobility will be told that will never fly in the US Congress. I know I'm fully aware of that, and this is probably mo one of the most critical moments to even ask that question. But then again, uh, Secretary Mead correctly said, Mexico has made reforms on energy. Do you foresee that the leaders of our three countries will bring that element into the picture? We do a, a survey at CIDE every two years, and we ask people, do you want greater integration with the United States? And then people ask back, does that mean that I will be able to join my family in Chicago or not? If it means that, that there will be family reunification, yes, I want greater integration with the United States. If it means that only the usual suspects will carry business as usual, then I'm not interested because I'm not gonna be part of that, you know, of the game. Okay, okay, let's turn it back to the panel. Go ahead, Bob, and, and others who wish to comment. Okay. Um, I'll try to deal with both sort of the economics and the politics. Mm -hmm. uh, the first, on the economics, I think, you know, what I and others are trying to do is make the case for why a common workforce in North America is in the U.S. interest, okay? And the reason I keep putting this globally because I, I didn't quite mention this part, but 500 million North Americans, three democracies, all the other things, all of a sudden it puts 1.3 billion Chinese in a different dimension, okay? So part of this, I'm not trying to put pose necessarily once against the other, but do you wanna think about making a stronger North America to make the United States stronger globally? Now clearly a part of this is an immigration reform, and as you know, and this is where practical politics comes in, People will have to deal with the security of the borders. They'll have to figure out some way to deal with the undocumented people and whether you create you know, a path to some legal status or whether citizenship or others are the elements. This is the raw sort of negotiating of, of politics. From my own point of view, you see, I think that you know, immigration in the United States is one of the things that has always made the United States a lively, dynamic place. So frankly, I would emphasize immigration based on economic need. I'd emphasize visas that were based on this. Uh, at the high end, you know, whether, whether it's green cards for people who study in American universities and other aspects, I think we need to see this as sort of 
part of the dynamism, competitiveness of the United States overall. Is it possible to put together a package on that? I don't know, but there's a fighting chance. I mean, you saw a bill that was passed by the Senate. Frankly, you had the House that was sort of willing to start to take this piecemeal. It got caught up into other issues. It's not the first time it happens in US politics. And by the way, there's a political interest for both parties to uh, be open-minded on this and to try to push the issue forward. So there's a possibility of trying to go that uh, direction. What I'm also trying to do is actually move a little bit beyond immigration. In other words, I'm trying to talk about immigration, not just related to citizenship, but worker mobility, okay? And, and for example, here's a practical step. NAFTA included a special visa program. It's a, uh, it's a, a NAFTA uh, TN. And it's much more limited than some of the other uh, U.S. visa programs. And it's, it's only available for a year. There's restrictions on what your spouse can do, so on and so forth. This is a practical step that we could do to be able to expand the mobility at the professional level. Now, I realize that doesn't deal with all the different concerns, but it starts to show the integration of the workforce. These things that we're talking about at the educational system. I think that the, some of the uh, support for this would grow if there was a sense of, hey, these are tremendous resources. This is a different, you know, this is education, skills, and talent. There have been efforts to design, as I referenced, mobility accords that actually work as sort of lower wage workers, but you got sensitivities here on both unions and employers, how you manage it. Doesn't necessarily have to mean citizenship, but does it mean that you could be able to have cross-border workflows? So, you know, what, what I and others can do is to try to force these on the agenda, see sort of a common economic interest in a global context, and frankly, you know, there's a lot of different issues in my life I've had to deal with that you know have political downsides and upsides. Over the long term, this is going to be in parties' political interest to try to be open on these topics. So it's the best way I could answer it. Okay, let me turn it to Dan next, if you would, uh, both on this and also on um, your question in the second table about uh, how do we get beyond some of these political issues that that you raised. <clears throat> let me <clears throat> let me start with with that in terms of how we get beyond. Um, partly are things like this, um, to have conversations that um, try to engage the kind of the real core issues uh, and go about educating folks. Again, this isn't, we're not just talking to the folks in the room. Uh, we're talking to folks beyond this room. And also there's a piece of relying on all of you to take what we do here today back to your, your environments uh, to continue this conversation, to elevate this conversation in a way that is vital to the, to the national interest of the United States, to the national interests uh, of Mexico moving forward. Um, and also, and to tie it to Carlos's question, um, I found it interesting that you started with, you wanted to take this to the perspective of the average, uh, and I, you may have said the average American. Uh, I'm gonna take it to what the average American, the average um, US. Um, one of the most fascinating things here is who that person is, is changing. And who that person is is changing really quickly. Um, and, and it's not a function of immigration anymore, right? His, Latino population growth in the United States is not being driven by immigration. It's being driven by natural population growth. And so who and what it is to be that average American is shifting in a way that quite frankly can be unsettling. Um, we've seen it as it has occurred in different parts of the country. The nice thing about it, the comforting thing about it, is there's a, there's a curve to this. That when it initially occurs in communities, um, when you have an influx of change, of demographic change, there's a somewhat visceral reaction to it from those in the status quo. But over time, that changes. Over time, people realize that demography may be different, but our values aren't, our desires aren't, our ability to contribute to a greater societal good are the same. And you can see this in terms of people's views of other, community by community across the United States, particularly community by community about Latinos in the United States, because one of the interesting things that's happened over the last 10 years is a dispersion of the Latino population in the United States. Sure, it has grown and intensified in places where Latinos, where we have been he traditionally, uh, and, and proverbially where the border crossed communities rather than communities crossed the border. Um, but it's also spread out to other parts of the United States. And again, the, 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 the heartening aspect of this is 
Um, and the great kind of assimilative in a, in, a, in a positive sense is the creation of a common American understanding of what that average American is. And that average, that new average American's connectivity back to places like Mexico, back to other places in Latin America, are necessarily gonna change our politics around these issues. Uh, and those who are, are standing in the way of that are going to ultimately get run over. Um, and it won't happen in six weeks from now. Um, it probably won't happen two years and six weeks from now. Um, but it's this kind of political change that is happening and it's gonna change, and I think this ties back to it changes the political discourse going forward. Uh, and enlightened folks in both political parties get this. Uh, unfortunately, they're not winning the day at the moment in both political parties. Um, but that interconnectivity, the, the ancestral identification, the, the largest group in the United States today in terms of identifying with a country of origin or ancestry is Mexico, right? In the United States, recently having passed Germany and long ago passed the English, the Irish, the Italian. And again, this isn't as shocking to this audience because of where you live, um, but to the folks listening at home uh, and listening at work, that can be a little unsettling still. Um, but the, one of the greatness of this country is its ability to deal with those kinds of changes and the, and the feedback loop through our politics that I think ultimately, and over a fairly short time horizon, will start changing these issues in a, benefit, in a mutually beneficial way to the United States and Mexico. Okay, thank you. I want to see if there's another round we can take from the audience, and we'll bring it back to the panel and we'll close out. Let me start back here. Uh, we need the microphone here. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this has been a thread in many of your comments. And by the way, thank you for your comments. Uh, education. I work for an educational institution. We're trying to partner with UNAM, as a matter of fact, right now. But there are a lot of challenges and changes in Mexico in the educational system and in the U.S. also. But, and there are a lot of challenges in terms of cooperation, K through 12, community college, university, things such as language acquisition, visas, uh, acceptance of certification from one country to another, et cetera. What is being done now between the two countries in cooperation and, and what more can be done to foster better cooperation in education? Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Paula, did you have, have a question as well? Thank you, my name is Paola Garcia. I want to thank you for this excellent dialogue. And my comment or question is, how more Mexicans can have access to this dialogue? I believe this uh, discourse is, yes, somehow included in advertisement in Mexico, but the message of a greater vision, North American competitiveness, needs to include the public opinion and probably local governments in a greater extent that has happened till today. So we all align in the same effort. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, there was one on the far left here. Hi, my name is Paul Wade. I'm a recent graduate from uh, Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. And um, one of the things that I was kind of wondering about is we, we were talking about the very kind of practical and pragmatic things like energy and whatnot. Um, kind of looking at the International Boundary and Water Commission, this is an organization which has had uh, lots of success. We can see that with, with uh, Minute 319. And I was wondering, now, now this is a, a treaty delegated organization, but I was wondering if there's any sort of implementation that we could get going on other very pragmatic um, topics. Okay, thank you. And I think that's it, that's what I see. So I wanna turn it back to you all. A number of issues were brought up. Some were, have already been addressed, but the Sister Cities point, I, I don't know if you wanted to say more about that. Um, Minister, if you wanted to say more about labor mobility and speed of border crossing, both on the goods and on the labor, that would be of some interest. Um, on having more Mexicans here and think about this kind of dialogue, that's an interesting question as well and then the specifics of water or education or exchange. So let me turn it to you, Minister, first, and then we'll go down the row. Thank you. 
Well, well thank you. I'll, I'll just talk in wrapping up and I will take an opportunity to recognize the very good work by our ambassador and our undersecretary. I think the US-Mexico relationship needs a mix of champions and architecture in order to foster. And I think these last couple of years, we have been able to develop a good architecture. We have tried to turn the, the North American Leaders Summit into a summit that actually comes out with a roadmap as to what you want to do and a roadmap that is actually actionable and you can follow through and you can check whether or not what was committed is actually being undertaken. We also constructed a high level economic dialogue. Some of the results are quite visible. Some of the pipelines that Dan spoke about uh, actually came through as being part of that high level economic dialogue. We also have a Mexico US Entrepreneurship and Innovation Council that allows us to identify policies that will be useful in empowering small and medium enterprises, that will be useful in empowering women participation. Uh, we have a binational forum on higher education. And one of the objectives of that forum is to have by the end of the administration 100,000 Mexicans that are actually exposed to an academic experience in the US. So I think that in a way, we have some very good champions of the North American view. A couple of them are, are to my both right and left uh, that, that really think that there is something to the North American idea that will help improve the quality of life of Mexico, the US and Canada. We have sort of like the architecture and we see a, a higher degree of involvement of other players in bringing forth this North American idea. Uh, governors, majors, the mayor of Phoenix has been to Mexico a couple, of, a couple of times. He has opened up an office in Mexico to promote the, the economy. Mexico, in turn, has opened an office in Phoenix to give support to the business relationship that we would want to have. So this sister-to-sister -sister program is something that makes a lot of sense. Again, in a way, in an economy as big as ours is, as big as the US is, with a population that is, again, big on both sides, if we get things done at a city to city level, at a state to state level, that will generate an environment that will make it more feasible for us to achieve things that we want to do nationally. So I think that these initiatives, getting the students to, to, to know each other uh, and really fostering an environment where this gets a broader view and broader support and that makes it politically more viable is something that we could continue to work on. And just in ending, Carlos Heredia participated. He's very much a North American idea in and of himself, educated in Canada, teaching in Mexico, and an expert in the US-Mexican uh, relationship. But he spoke about a survey, which I think is quite interesting because for the last 10, 12 years, you have been able to poll the average citizen and the leaders in Mexico with the same set of questions. And you can actually track how the attitude of the average leader and the average uh, Mexican feel and what their attitudes are towards different parts of the world, how they see themselves and how they see interacting, Mexican interaction with different parts of the world. And you see a warming up to, to an, a North American vision. Very good, thank you. Dan, to you. Yeah, just by the way, thanks again to the McCain Institute and for the Center for American Progress. And just to, to, to grab a point that tells a little bit about my age, from this distance, you can clearly see the McCain Institute, but there's no way to read the Center for American Progress, so just put that one <laughs> in a higher but type. That's in, what in the United States we call home field advantage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was gonna say something about the, the demographics of our natural constituencies on the size of the font, but yeah. that's... Um, well, and, and we need to start <laughs> wrapping up, so, so go ahead. The, I just wanted to, to make two kind of brief points. One, to, to what other mechanisms exist, and um, the, the Water Commission is obviously a, a unique bird, uh, and it's been quite effective in managing a complex set of issues. Um, and this goes a little bit to the point, Bob, in terms of using, champ, champ, using an event, kind of action forcing events within bureaucracies to then create mechanisms to follow through. The, the North American Leaders Summit is a summit that has had its good days, it's had its bad days. Um, it has two, per, I think, two relatively willing partners and one less willing who's, we're not talking about that today. That one was pretty good, by the yeah, way. No, no, the last one was quite, it was very good. Uh, and, and remarkably, there's going to be one um, next year, I understand, uh, <laughs> given, given that it's Canada's chance to, to host. 
Um, an example of using that kind of event, and this was going back in administration in Mexico, was it when President Calderon visited uh, President Obama for a state visit. Um, you get the attention of the entire United States government when you're hosting a state visit. It's an incredibly useful tool. Uh, and one of the things that came out of that was a mechanism for dealing with border issues uh, on a both interagency basis in both kind of the 21st century border initiative, um, where teams from all the departments and agencies in the United States who have something to do with border facilitation and other kind of border infrastructure related issues and security related issues were able to finally know who their counterparts were at a political level within the Mexican government and set up a mechanism to meet, to have action plans to follow through on items. Um, so those kinds of things do exist um, and we need more of them in the sense of having those kind of concrete deliverables come out of these kinds of meetings and have it be somebody's responsibility to make sure those things happen. And then a real quick word on educational exchanges. I think they're fundamental here. Um, the, because they, they reinforce the kind of people-to-people -people connectivity that already exists between our two countries. Uh, the, I, one of my prouder things was being a part of the launch of a hemisphere-wide educational exchange initiative that the President Obama announced uh, back in Santiago, Chile, several years ago, called 100,000 Strong in the Americas, the, the purpose of which is to catalyze with the private sector, with the academic sector, and with governments around the region to essentially double in both directions the number of students who come to the United States from Latin America and from the United States who go to countries in Latin America to study. Um, those are the kinds of folks we need. We need to prepare people that way for the future that we're building together. Um, it's something that has gained momentum, quite frankly, from the, the, the big bets that co a country like Mexico is making uh, and putting resources behind. Um, Brazil is another active participant. Other countries in the region are. Uh, and it's something that, again, is trying to do more with less in the sense of <laughs> there aren't a whole lot of extra government, U.S. government dollars to put against this. Uh, but I'm actually now reassociated with a program that is seeking private sector support for innovation for an innovation fund that helps schools that are looking to expand or get in the business have that the kind of nudge they need or the expertise the access to the expertise they need to become engaged in educational exchanges between the United States and Mexico between the United States and other countries in the hemisphere I think it is a fundamental piece of building um, the kinds of future that we need to build in North America and to build in the Americas writ large and again thank you very much to and it's been a unbelievable honor and privilege to be on this panel with the secretary uh, and, with the, and with the former secretary. Thank you. Bob? Well, I'd also like to uh, thank you and, and CAP for uh, organizing this. Let me just close with uh, six points. One, uh, to reinforce what Dan said, coming back to your question about immigration and labor force, for people who are trying to advance the North America concept, we do have to be highly attentive to the anxieties that are created, the loss of control. These are real. Uh, you know, again, I live in Washington or Virginia. I work globally, but I actually spend a fair amount of time in the Southwest. I'm in the border region, and I've seen what, how destabilizing this is. So you have to be able to address that issue to be able to get on to the issues of commonality uh, and interest. Uh, second, your, your question about the International Boundary and Water Commission. It's a good example. There's actually a similar uh, example over about a century with Canada. Um, and uh, they, in, there's some lessons to be learned about how those are reconstructed. But as, as Jose Antonio said too, you know, we've got changing uh, sort of water and other conditions. We're now going to have to move those to be able to deal with a sort of a different generation of issues. Third, the question about uh, expanding this debate in Mexico, that's where we really have to uh, work with Mexicans to figure out. I compliment the Center for American Progress because part of this, this is the first of four sessions and there'll be two, as I understand it, that are gonna take place in Mexico. So that creates a basis for it. I've mentioned this Council on Foreign Relations report. We're gonna uh, do a presentation back in Mexico City. We actually did some of our, as we were preparing the report, we went to Mexico City. I'm hoping these can be grist for various mills to sort of uh, drive the discussion. Uh, fourth, how do we raise the profile in the United States? In a sense, the question Kurt keeps asking. Look, this is again the, the combination of politics and policy. Uh, as Jose Antonio knows, 
I'm in touch with various Republicans who would like to move to higher office. Uh, I say, look, before you go to Europe, why don't you go to Mexico or go to Mexico and Canada? That's why you got a lot of governors going there. I said it makes its sense as a matter of a, a new foreign policy. It's a sense of, of economics. It's a sense of energy. It's a sense of, of Mexican Americans. This is a no brainer, you know. And so, frankly, Mexico has been very supportive of trying to do that. We need to do that at the legislative level as well. But we also need to get this backed with facts and analysis. And that's why I'm very pleased about a later portion of this session where you've got some of the faculty at, at Arizona State University who've been doing some modeling about how these changes can make effects. And when Senator McCain first put together this institute, frankly, I said to Kurt and said to the senator, look, you know, you've been known and obviously in terms of Asia and, and Europe, but I really hope you do something important for Mexican and North American relations, because it's a natural given the senator's proclivities and other aspects. So we, we need to find institutions on both sides of the border that, that sort of add to the analysis, or as Jose Antonio said, the fact-based aspect. A fifth point, one of the greatest challenges, and you mentioned this from Scottsdale, is a lot of this comes down to the state and local level. So part of the challenges of doing this from the NSC or the State Department is you don't have the levers. And frankly, the question is, how can we, in a sense, we're gonna have to develop a transnational foreign policy. How do we create the enabling environment? How do we support those at the state and local level? And frankly, the United States has gotta get a lot better at that, but I think you know, that's one of the reasons that we're, we're pushing this agenda. And then, and then sixth, um, I'll close with this point. And I just I felt it over 30 years of public policy. It's good to have strategy, it's good to feel good about things. You gotta do stuff. The way that you really build credibility is, it may look small, but building some sense of, the, uh, of results. And particularly in North America, I'll close with this, in the United States, you still have to realize, we're the biggest country of these three, by far. If we're gonna convince the Mexicans and Canadians we're serious about this, we gotta deliver some actions and results. And frankly, some of the places that start are things that might be on Mexico and Canada's agenda a little bit more that are always on our agenda to show that we're serious about it. That's the nature of big power leadership. That's terrific. I, I want you all to join me in thanking our panelists here for an excellent discussion. I want to thank you, Minister, in particular, for making the time to be here. It's really an honor for us for, to have you here uh, and to have you at Arizona State. Sure. It was wonderfully moderated, so thank, thank you. you, Kurt. Thank you. And Dan and, and Bob, in between your, your many board meetings to squeeze us in, we, <laughs> we value that. Thank you very, very much. Paris, I think you have a few administrative announcements. <laughs> yes. Um, we have, first of all, I've been seeing your tweets. Great job, you guys. You're really active on social media, so we really appreciate it. Number two, lunch will be provided over here on the side, and so please help yourself uh, right now to lunch, and there are uh, also some drinks up in the back portion of the broom. So please, grab lunch, come back, and we'll reconvene with a really interesting and, uh, project from our ASU professors. So please enjoy lunch, and sit back down after lunch so we can get started. Thank you. If we could all take our seats, if you are gathering in the back or if you're talking or getting some good lunch, if you could take your seats, we are ready to begin our special lunch presentation on the U.S.-Mexico economic model as well as policy analysis uh, for this. These are a, a team of uh, researchers from Arizona State University. So if you could still, while you're eating, uh, utilize social media because I promise you 
they're going to give you some very fascinating, insightful uh, insights into this economic model. So please, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Hoffman. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, please continue enjoying uh, this, uh, the lunch. What we have for you today is the fruits of a uh, considerable amount of labor on the part of our uh, research team. I want to tell you briefly about the ASU Mexico initiative, an initiative um, that's very important to uh, our university. Uh, we hear that often from our president. Um, it's an, an initiative designed ultimately to promote trade and economic development between the two countries, to facilitate decision making through analysis of potential binational, national, and regional policies, and to maximize ultimately the economic prosperity of the United States and Mexico, with a focus on the 10 state border region. Because of course, being a border state ourselves in Arizona, that's an important uh, area of focus for us. So, a very important component of the, the ASU uh, US-Mexico initiative is the tool that we are releasing today for the first time. This is a, uh, I don't even call it a beta version, it's an alpha version. The tool operates, it is functional, it is not equipped with all, all of the bells and whistles and capabilities that it ultimately will be but it is designed to provide regional and national policymakers, politicians, businesses with objective insights requ required to enable effective policy dialogue with real trade-off analysis computed in real time. So this is not uh, a, a tool that operates in some back room and you give us a question and it goes off and takes days to crunch numbers. Um, this is designed to operate any place on the planet, uh, in co congressional offices, uh, Mexican ministry offices, and of course in our decision theater settings on uh, both the Tempe and Washington campuses. So our challenge uh, as researchers was to assemble a model that had sufficient sophistication and rigor to withstand, withstand the critique and challenge from uh, some of the best economists at uh, the World Bank, uh, gov government staffers, uh, the, the think tanks around the, the planet, but also be capable of portraying results to policies in a real-time scenario. And um, we have some uh, preliminary applications today uh, that you're gonna see, but we need your help. We need feedback on other applications that you would like to see. We're gonna focus on energy and border wait times today, uh, we have education and immigration reform in the works, and we would like to hear from you. So um, what you could do to monitor our progress is to go to our website, and this is an image from or taken from our website, at USMexPAT, that's Policy Analysis Tool, USMexPAT.com, and you will get updates on our progress, what we're up to, and what we're uh, de designing uh, this research agenda to be. Um, the, the website currently has a data visualization tool, an array of white papers that represent the background research uh, that we have done today, a discussion of the methodology, a description of the research team, and ultimately a link to our policy tool that we're gonna be unveiling today. It won't be available today, but it certainly will in the next couple of weeks. And most interestingly, most of the site can be viewed in either English or Spanish at your discretion. So I'm here to thank our sponsors, ASU's President's Office, the McCain Institute, uh, everybody who contributed to this. In fact, I'd like to take this opportunity before I turn it to the research team that's gonna uh, deliver the content here. I would like to acknowledge everybody that contributed uh, to this effort. And that would be, please stand, all of our members of the ASU US MexPAT uh, research team, uh, Paula and uh, Sapna, uh, also me members of the ASU uh, initiative, and our uh, colleagues from COLIF. 
I would like to acknowledge you as well. Thank you so much for collaborating with us on some of the data that was needed for this tool. So uh, let, me, let me just say that for everything that goes well this afternoon in, in this demonstration, it's a tribute to the research team. Uh, anything that doesn't go well, blame Hoffman because I'm sure uh, my colleague Tim James will uh, already do that. So I'd like to introduce the, the moderator for, uh, for this uh, unveiling, and this is Professor Timothy James, who has been instrumental in leading uh, the development of our computable general equilibrium model and uh, directing uh, very much most of this research team. Our, biz, our uh, project manager, Dr. Anthony Evans, uh, who is sitting immediately to my left here, and then professors Jose Mendez and Kent Hill that will be contributing uh, to this uh, demonstration today. So thank you very much, and without further ado, Tim. <clears throat> thank you, Dennis. Um, so as you've noticed, my accent's slightly different. Uh, I'm from New River, Arizona. I suspect a few people know where that is, but I actually do really live in New River. It's a, this is a New River accent. Um, a few things to sort of start off with. Um, Ant's from the same small town as me in a, another country, obviously. We're from Wales in the UK. Uh, the UK as it is at the moment, but because it might not be the UK anymore, it might be the dis-UK sort of fairly quickly. So we've been having quite an interesting parallel debate about um, a potential border between Scotland and England. And, you know, I'm anti and he's pro, obviously. So um, what I want to say to start off with is we're really happy to answer questions if you want to ask questions. And that's why I've got my four colleagues with me here. Because if you ask me a hard question, I'll pass it on to them. If you ask me an easy question, I'll just answer it myself so I can take all the glory. Um, we've got some slight technical difficulties because what we're actually doing is running a model which is located on a server in Tempe, I think. So we might have some um, glitches in terms of it taking a little bit of while to sort of spin around. You'll see what it, what it sort of does. Um, we've got a kind of program of things that we're going to look at, but we're happy to answer questions and be a bit interactive. Part of the idea of um, constructing this, this visualization tool, is that it would be something that would be interactive and you can try policy scenarios on the fly and sort of figure out what effects you find so that it's, it's an interactive tool that tries to integrate policies that um, users, um, people who are interested in policy analysis, can actually use as a way of comparing different policies at different levels so they can see the effect on both sides of the border and the two countries generally. I want to start off with a little bit of introduction just about what we've actually done here. This is basically what's called a computable general equilibrium model. Um, I want to pay tribute to one of my colleagues at the back who's got a three-week-old baby. He's not paying attention to me at the moment. Hello. Pay attention. Yeah. Who's um, also spent the last 18 months in a bunker with me, so he's barely seen his three-week-old baby while he's been sort of coding like crazy so, to make this work. Um, and what we've got at the center is a kind of model, and the model looks really messy and horrible and is very difficult to interpret. So wrapped around it is this tool that we're going to show you. Um, and what I want to say a little bit about the, the, the model itself is, it, I think it's really one of the first attempts to try and model with the border region as a kind of central part of it, the interaction between effectively three areas, Mexico, the US, and then our third area is called rest of world, ROW. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of CGE model plus, because one of the things it does, which normal CGE models that people construct, um, does what it does that those models don't generally do is it tries to distribute effects amongst the border states as well as for the two countries. So hoping that it's going to go OK, um, let's try some of the things that we're going to look at. And so the two policies we thought we'd try and we're, we're ready to go with is energy reform in Mexico and then trying to reduce border wait times to see what the effects of those two scenarios would be, two policy scenarios on um, economic development in both the US and Mexico and in, in particular in the border states. So we've got kind of like a circus thing here and I am the kind of moderator so I get to call upon them for the first. I have to tell you we've been doing this for about 18 months, two years and the level of debate, we, we meet every two weeks and if you can imagine four economics professors, there's a standard joke about economics. You know, like if you get two economists in a room you get three opinions. So if you can imagine a large group of us in a room, we dif di uh, disagree like crazy about how to do things or whatever. So this is the sum total of efforts. But I want to start off with Dennis again. So Dennis is going to give us a very brief introduction to what we've been looking at in terms of potential energy reform in the oil and gas sector 
within Mexico. And then hopefully my colleague here, Antu, is going to run the actual model. We've got slight difficulties with the cable not being quite long enough to connect to our laptop, which is, I think you're getting the idea of our technical difficulties potentially, so bear with us. What we'll then be able to do is show you how it actually works in the context of the model and then sort of run through some of the results. Um, the other thing I want to say is that we're still in the development phase. This is really is the alpha version of the model and the tool itself. And so the results are kind of indicative. They're not the definitive what we think the right or wrong answer would be. They're just meant to try and illustrate how you would use a tool and what it gives us in terms of the capability to al analyze policies in, a, in an integrative, interactive framework. So over to you, Dennis. Um, energy reform, of course, has been all over the news. It's been uh, one of the center points of the, the reform agenda in Mexico uh, in recent months uh, over the last couple of years. The re actual reform can take a number of uh, avenues as to how it actually comes out. So as economists, what we've chosen to do is to think about energy reform and its conclusions and that would be the attraction of foreign direct investment into the ener energy sector in Mexico, the expansion of the energy sector in Mexico, and that could be both physical capital and human capital in terms of expertise. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we're going to observe in the, in the energy sector in Mexico is an increase in productivity. So what we've tried to do is to develop a tool that would allow people to understand if you have a significant increase in productivity or only a slight increase in pro productivity, exactly what the economic implications would be for the, both the U.S. and Mexico, and then how uh, those implications would fall on the northern Mexican states. So with that, so do you want to start running? So this is our, the front page of our tool. Um, the model is the kind of, this is the wrapper for the, the tool itself. Um, and we've got in here to start off with four main policy areas that we're interested in analyzing, and two are worked up for us for today. Energy reform and border wait times. And we're also working actively on educational reform. I think somebody was talking about their being interested in education as how education would affect potentially the, the two economies as well. And then the other one, which we've got a lot of discussion about how to do this, but we're also trying to model the effects of liberalization of um, uh, labor movements and immigration reform. So we're going to start off with energy reform. So this is what you get when you start off with our tool. Um, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to simulate the effect of a 50% improvement in terms of the productivity of the oil sector within Mexico. So we've just clicked on the oil sector, done 50%. Our affected geography is Mexico. It, it's not particularly big, but it's over there, and uh, hopefully we're going to run. It is going, please. <laughs> it might be a very long thing of me talking, of telling you what numbers look like. It's like Apollo 13. Remember when you didn't hear from the astronauts? So that's kind of where we feel right now. Is it going on? Oh. That's not good. So you connected, you're not connected to the internet. So I, I really hope Ant hasn't got anything really inappropriate on his laptop at this point. back in, go. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it's, it, we just sent some information to the server, and it's going to sort of bounce back. But it takes a little. It's a basically this is a really large model that 
has got an awful lot of information that it's, it's um, basically using to simulate the effect of what we just did on the US and Mexico economies and then cascade it down to a regional level so it tells us what happens within different states. And I think the best way to talk about it is when the results come up. It just take a few minutes for it to actually um, go through the server and come back again with the effects that we've actually got in here. Um, there are four quadrants to go, so I don't know whether I can string along for long enough. So, go, come on. So, okay, so we've got limited time. One of the things that we were interested in with the energy reform is something called the Dutch disease. Anybody ever heard of this? It's, a, it's an economic concept whereby if we get Mexico, um, if we give Mexico a kind of productivity boost in the oil sector, what would then happen is, it is working, thank you, is that, and we'll observe this hopefully when we actually look at some of the results, is that we wanted to see whether we would get in the context of our model um, some elements of this Dutch disease whereby because oil becomes a bigger sector and a lot of it might be exported, that leads to appreciation in the Mexican currency. And that then means that other industries are then disadvantaged, other sectors are disadvantaged relative to the oil sector. And it's referred to as the Dutch disease because um, Holland, I think, was one of the first countries that actually experienced this problem when it became a great trading nation. And um, what we'll see in here is we actually get a little bit of Dutch disease when we look at some of the regional effects. Um, in particular, uh, I think Kent's really interested in regional effects. He's been our main modeler on this. And I, I'm not very good at uh, pronunciation, so I'll try this one. And, Melissa can correct me. Is it Coahila? Okay. So if we look at that one, so maybe Kent can talk us through what actually happens here. Why is it taking so long? Okay. I think we're just about there. Sorry. One of, one of the good things is the way the, uh, the whole model works, if you've actually run one of these scenarios once, it stores them centrally. So if we got, went through 50% again, it would actually come up straight away. So this is our first results page. So in here, you can see we're concentrating particularly on the border region in here, but it gives us national results to start off with. So with our 50% improvement in the oil sector in terms of productivity in Mexico, the net impact on the two countries are to lead to a, about a $112 billion increase in GDP in Mexico and a $23 billion increase in US GDP. So both countries would benefit as a result of there being improved productivity, stimulate both economies. Um, our model can take on, and this is one of the things that we've debated quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of um, flavors as far as um, the way that macroeconomics works. And at the moment, we've really got it set to a kind of very neoclassical version of the world where we're assuming that basically we've got full employment and so what happens is that labor and capital markets are very flexible. And so what you'll see in here is that it, this actually says that the effect of what we just did is to improve employment in the US by five people. It's, it's not missing anything on the end, it's just five people and two people in Mexico. And the real reason for that is we're, it's just a simulation um, uh, thing, the five and the two people. Really, there's no change in employment. We're moving people around from one sector to another to reflect the change in wages and the change in the rental rate of capital, the, price of capital based upon um, what happens as we make one sector more productive and other sectors, relatively speaking, then become less productive. But what we do see is that there is a benefit in both countries in terms of the amount of payments to labor. So labor in the US and Mexico both benefit in terms of um, labor income. Now what we can do is we can sort of drill down a little bit, and I'm hoping my colleague here is going to be able to do this. We can go to specific um, areas if we want to. So this is the overall effect by clicking on the uh, particular elements in here. So maybe we could go down here. If you go down to this button, we get particular geography. So let's, let's do um, Coahila. Is that how you say it? I'm trying my best. In Mexico, and just illustrate what we get in here. So this now is the effect on that particular state in Mexico. And you can see here, this offers quite a big boost relative to the base level of GDP in the state. Um, and over in the, the sort of the green portion that we've got, go back a second the green portion over on the right hand side, what you can see is that we get a boost in terms of um, the size of the economy there, about $9 billion. Employment rises by about 16,000 because people are being attracted to that area because they, it's becoming a more attractive place for people to work, so labor tends to move around. 
and labor income also goes up. So just to try one of the other things, let's, um, let's try Texas. So if we click on Texas now, it'll tell you that the effect in Texas is a, is a, a small reduction in the size of the economy. It goes down a little bit. Um, employment falls a little bit in Texas, and we also get a fall in labor income associated with that as well. It's, it's relatively small compared to the size of the Texas economy, but what we are doing here is trying to be realistic and point out the winners and the losers in any kind of economic policy scenario. This is um, something else that we've looked at quite a lot as well. So our model has got 56 or 57 sectors in it, and this tells us the main three beneficiary sectors and the main three sectors that get affected by, um, detrimentally by the changes that we might make. And in here, you can sort of see a little bit of this thing, the, the Dutch disease issue. Um, so what happens is, are we in Texas still? So let's go to Coahuila and then do the sectoral thing. Okay, so in here, right. So in here, what we get is um, the beneficiaries and the losers in terms of, so the, the net um, effect is, is positive here, um, and the main beneficiaries are the, obviously the oil and gas sector, um, but some, some areas lose out, in particular transportation equipment, other machinery and indus industrial equipment. They have, sectors don't have great names in economic data, I'm sure you're aware of that, so they're big aggregations of things, but what's really going on here is those are detrimentally affected by a series of things, but one of the things is the change in the exchange rate is making it more difficult for those sectors to compete internationally, so they tend to lose exports a little bit. Um, and they also lose some skilled labor and some capital as it heads towards the oil and the gas sector. So this is a little bit of an evidence of what was referred to as this Dutch disease problem, so that you don't always get in any scenario that we've got, because we're trying to be realistic here, uh, a whole everybody benefiting or everybody losing. There's always a trade-off with some sectors benefiting and some of them losing as a result of the policy scenarios that we can try in here. Uh, I think maybe we could move on to look at um, border wait times. This is, a, this is a big issue that we've had a long discussion about, so. Okay, so in here, maybe we could introduce it by sort of Kent talking about the, what we've talked about in terms of border wait times. Sorry? Sure. Do we have a few minutes for me to talk just about sure. the regional we'll part? Sure. We'll run the, the model while we're, you're talking about the regional model. Okay. And then can you Let me say something about the regional times? component yeah. of the model, and uh, then if we have some time, I'll talk about the border wait times. Sure. Um, I, as he mentioned earlier, I've um, been really involved in trying to develop the regional part of this. Um, and um, for any of, any of you who are economic modelers, I have some notes, and you can kind of see exactly how I, I sort of uh, set this up if you'd like. Um, the regional analysis is driven partly by the national CGE results, uh, particularly with respect to wage rates. Uh, we assume that labor, at least in the long run, is very mobile, and so what happens to wage rates uh, by skill class will be fairly similar in size and direction uh, across different regions and states of each of the economies. Uh, but what we know is that uh, depending upon the industrial structure of a particular region, the overall level of employment and activity may, may vary from region to region. Um, in very basic regional economics, uh, we know that what is especially important are the export base uh, or basic industries in regions. And uh, if their fortunes are different uh, across different basic sectors, then that'll show up in the regions. Uh, in terms of the uh, Coahuila, did I do that all right? I wish it was Chihuahua, but you know I can do that one, you know? But uh, Coahuila will do that. Uh, it's the most interesting one, unfortunately. Um, as, you, uh, as you may know, uh, what really stands out for that economy is they have a really large transportation and automobile sector. Uh, if you look at uh, employment, uh, the transportation sector accounts for 8% of employment in that state and it only accounts for 1% of employment across the whole nation. So crudely put, auto production and parts of production is eight times as important in Coahuila as it is in Mexico as a whole. And what that will mean, and this came out in our energy scenario, if some kind of economic policy or event uh, serves to contract the automobile industry, uh, then Coahuila as a state may actually suffer, may actually contract, uh, or if it does grow, it'll grow much more slowly uh, than the nation as a whole. 
and this happens not just because of automobiles, but as we understand in regional economics, a lot of economic activity, especially services and things that are not widely traded but are local goods, will tend to go up and down depending upon the fortunes of the export base industry. So a contraction in auto production will not only be felt there, uh, but when incomes are lost there, then all the service sector industries uh, will tend to shrink as well. Um, Tim already showed you some of the results that we actually got for Coahuila. Um, I, I don't know if he, he brought it out, but uh, in our simulations, Coahuila employment, the overall level of employment, actually shrinks in this exercise by 1%. Uh, so while for the country as a whole, uh, there's a, a negligible effect on overall employment, uh, there is very much a churning and a reallocation of people between different sectors. Uh, on the whole, service sectors tend to grow and expand throughout Mexico, but as Tim noted, uh, because of this Dutch disease phenomenon, uh, manufacturing in general will actually be hurt in Mexico, and some of the northern Mexican states are especially involved in manufacturing, not only Coahuila, but uh, Baja California and, and uh, Chihuahua, and all three of those states actually contract uh, if you look at the level of employment. Um, so as I said, uh, uh, that's just briefly how this kind of regional analysis works. Uh, it's, uh, it was set up to be very well integrated with the CGE model, and if you do have kind of a modeling interest, I'll be happy to talk to you later. Uh, let me just say a few words about border wait times then. Okay. Um, the, um, this is, uh, we're still kind of talking about and debating how to represent this in the model and how to interpret things. Um, one of the issues we've tried to come to grips with is that uh, what we're all familiar with are long lines, especially going northward and truckers spending a lot of time, hours in line, and we can well imagine that that adds to the cost, the shipping cost itself. Uh, but what a lot of people have explored is the actual cost of the delays themselves. Uh, this is really obvious in terms of produce and things that are perishable. Uh, the item that you get is just not worth as much. Uh, and this may have nothing to do with the shipping cost per se. Uh, for manufacturing, especially in auto parts and electronic components, uh, we've long understood that as we develop more of a global supply chain, uh, it becomes more difficult to manage inventories when there's uncertainty about when you'll receive shipments and if there are long delays involved. And so something that has been looked at quite a bit uh, is the uh, extra cost in terms of inventory holding that firms must do uh, if they're subject to uncertain delays. Uh, so part of uh, our job has been to just kind of set this up, get a sense of uh, the costs involved and how that would affect international trade in the, in the two economies. Um, I've been really uh, interested in uh, the insights, uh, if you know the name David Hummels, he's someone at Purdue University uh, who's looked a lot at uh, the time costs involved in delays in trade, and he's really focused on uh, the, the time costs themselves as opposed to the extra shipping costs. And uh, he's done some work, uh, and uh, people at the International Trade Commission have done a lot of work uh, trying to document the extent of these delays. And uh, part of what I've learned over the last six months and kind of reading off and on about this is that the notorious delays from the south to the north may not be as large as the delays that are involved in bringing goods southward. Uh, there's been a lot of great field work that's been done, and these, this was recently expressed again at a conference at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas this past June, uh, that the southbound delays uh, that don't have so much to do with waiting in a line to cross the border, uh, but have to do with Mexican brokers that are involved in unloading and counting, inspecting cargo for pre-clearance, uh, and uh, the warehouses that are filled up with uh, trucks uh, as they await uh, inspection, this may be not measured in hours, but in days. Uh, actually, a, a presentation recently has indicated that these delays may range from two to five days. Uh, not two to five hours, but two to five days. So uh, a big, uh, an important part is to just to set this up and make sure we have some sense of the extent of these delays and what the nature of the costs are that are involved. Um, uh, I've been very careful and done a lot of work in trying to uh, uh, measure the impediments that are involved in this. And uh, just to kind of summarize a lot of work that I've done, uh, if you think of them as kind of analogous to a tariff uh, in the way that they affect trade and they impede trade, 
in the southbound direction, goods coming from the United States into Mexico, um, it's not an absurd number to think of these as being similar to about a 5.5% ad valorem tariff. If you consider the actual monetary costs involved, uh, compensating the Mexican brokers and the drage companies and the warehouse owners and all those parties involved, and if you add to that these kind of time costs that are involved, that's a sense of what, sh what this means in terms of a tariff equivalent. Uh, in the other direction, it may be something on the order of 2%. So uh, that's uh, just kind of a handle on uh, the extent to which these are genuinely barriers to trade. As a little bit of perspective, uh, shortly before NAFTA was signed, the average tariff rate on manufacturers coming into Mexico was about 15 percentage points. So here I'm talking about uh, other kinds of costs that have to do with border delays that may be like a 5% tariff, so we're talking about maybe one-third the size uh, of the uh, effects that were eliminated in terms of NAFTA. So uh, this is very crude, but perhaps we can think of the benefits uh, in terms of trade and economic welfare maybe being as large as one-third the size uh, of what they were from uh, NAFTA and removing tariffs and, and import licensing restrictions and that sort of thing. Um, we've actually uh, done some runs here. Um, Tim and I sort of disagree on whether we've got this interpreted correctly, and I'm going to hand it back to him. But uh, one of the issues uh, involved is uh, exactly what metric do you use to look at welfare changes? Do you just simply look at GDP, or how do you take into account uh, advantages that consumers may realize in this process? Uh, so we're still very much uh, fine-tuning that. But uh, what I just explained to you is the basic setup and the way I was looking at it and give you some sense of order of magnitude as to what we think we're going to find. Yeah, thanks, Ken. So as he said, we've been having a long... This is one of our subjects of major debate between us, the, the pair of us, a lot of the time. So this is a run that um, we just did where we've simulated the effect of reducing um, southbound wait times by 95%. We haven't done anything to northbound at all. This is just southbound going from what Ken said to maybe from somewhere around maybe 5% of being the uh, added cost to goods when you're exporting them from the US to Mexico. And the net effects that the model gives us just for this, and, and these things I, I wouldn't want to hang my hat on as being correct, but they're just indicative of what maybe might be the effect here. The net benefits of that are that the US would tend to export more goods because some of its goods would become cheaper. It benefits to the tune of about $10.5 billion dollars. Um, Mexican GDP, and we've measured GDP in Mexico using um, what's called PPP, Purchasing Power Parity, just so we can use something where we're not um, really subject to exchange rate issues. That tends to fall as it imports more US goods, because we're not allowing for any goods to go back the other way so much. We're not improving border wait times going northbound. And uh, the debate between us is Kent is an international economist by training, and he's unhappy with the fact that Mexico doesn't benefit as a result of this effect as well. So we're sort of debating about whether the model's truly reflecting reality. And as he said, one of the issues is, I'll come to you in a minute, Jose. One of the issues is um, whether we're actually measuring things properly. Because what would be happening in Mexico is that people may be experiencing no real loss in terms of their well-being. It's just that the way we're measuring it, because we're measuring it at lower prices, it makes it look like people are worse off than they really are. So it's something we need to return to in terms of the way we model things so we don't give people a false impression about whether we've just made a, a whole country worse off by liberalizing trade. And we, in, in economics, we generally believe that liberalizing trade is always a good thing. Re reducing imperfections in any kind of trading market always tends to lead to more trade, and more trade is always better. So in here, we just simulated this effect in here. And uh, maybe, does Jose, do you want to say something? I just want to underscore that I, too, am an international trade economist, and in, in that result is conceptually implausible. And he's not an international trade economist, and I'm worried I saw somebody writing something down. Erase that. Okay? Do not do that. Don't take that number as, as meaningful. The only reason I'm listening to Jose is he's now deputy head of the department of economics and in charge of the teaching schedule. So next year, if I disagree with him vehemently and stick to the numbers, I'll end up teaching the graveyard shift of absolutely everything if I'm not careful here. Um, 
the reason why we're showing this is be because we wanted to show that we've got more than just one functionality and we're going to build a thing out. And I think, as Dennis said at the start, we're happy to take questions, comments, and we want people to look at this and come up with things and say, how can we make it more user-friendly? How can we produce more metrics that people would find meaningful? And how can we add to the functionality? So this is our first showing, really. I, I did say, and I want to emphasize, the numbers are sort of the alpha version. I think approximately the model works about right. The magnitude seemed to come out at about the right kind of level for the stimulants and the depressants that we add into things. And that's really where we're at at the moment in terms of the m whole modeling exercise. We want to spend more time working on this because what we really want to do, I think, our ultimate aim is to produce something not for our own academic benefit but more from a kind of policymaker's perspective and in particular from the point of view of people trying different policies which seem to be from completely different areas, like educational reform and energy reform are completely different areas of activity. And really what we should be doing is maybe looking at these things to see where the most effect could happen the most quickly so that it benefits both sides of the border. Um, and that's really what our tool is really all about, is allowing policymakers a debate which is quantitative rather than qualitative, and I always think that's really useful. So it at least starts a debate about what are the good policies and what are the not such good policies, what gives you a big effect and what gives you a small effect. So in here, for instance, you see that even when we got border wait times down, even if you take this effect that there is a negative impact on the Mexican economy just in terms of the way we're measuring GDP, you'll notice that the order of magnitude is much smaller for border wait times than it is for energy reform. Energy reform would be something if you could engender it, um, productivity improvements and a lot of infusion of foreign capital would have a huge effect on both countries in terms of the size of the economies. And maybe effort, if it's going to be expended, should be spent more on those kind of things. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try lots of things altogether, but it seems to me that it's a tool where you could look at those things and prioritize rather than just talking generally about things in a kind of nebulous way. It gives some real numbers to hang up on. Um, one other thing I just wanted to show in terms of its functionality, maybe you could bring up the menu where you can show the scenarios that you've run and then... So these are all the ones that we've just been running here, all the different ones we tried. And you save them all in here. So if you want to compare like um, one policy with another and its effect, you just click on it, the model will then... doesn't need to regenerate itself. It actually just reloads the, the scenario that you've just tried. It saves it. And so you can try them relative to each other. And ultimately, what we're going to produce is something where you can compare policies side by side, um, play with things, and come out with things where you can have sliders. Um, you can try different policies in different areas and compare them and see what the effects are. Uh, Jose Dennis? is requesting equal time. Oh, great. Actually, uh, um, I don't know if you notice I'm the only one that's not speaking here. I drew the short straw since there was not enough time. Yet, I, uh, I want to talk a little, I want to shift the discussion a little bit to the what's coming soon. Um, I'm really excited about what's coming soon, especially in terms of, uh, uh, I'm working on immigration reform and the educational reforms in Mexico, and the, the simulation for the immigration reform is exciting because <coughs> um, the, we've, we've based the analysis on, on Senator McCain's uh, immigration reform bill, and uh, crucial to the reform bill in terms of the economic implications for both the northern side and the southern side of the border depend on, on what happens to the flow of undocumented or unauthorized uh, migrants from Mexico into the United States. So in particular, in, you saw here you could put in the efficiency parameter, but you will, in the analysis of immigration reform, be able to say, well, what if the United States is very effective with E-Verify or very effective in uh, controlling the inflow of undocumented workers into the border? You can adjust that in terms of the, the, the degree of effectiveness or the tightness of the border. So you will be able to see what the consequences are for U.S. GDP, uh, you, uh, for income uh, on both sides of the border as a consequence of the d degree of tightness of the border that, that you expect or that you see. Right. And that's the only thing I wanted to say. Do we have time for questions? Or? Oh, I'm, I'm being told we have, by the boss we don't have time for questions. I think he's hovering, so... Let me, let me offer the opportunity for a question or two, but I want to make sure we, we keep moving as well, too, because uh, we have another panel to get through. Uh, but what I wanted to say is something about the significance of this. 
because I think you've got a lot of uh, visibility now on the depth of analysis, the rigorous effort to collect data, to link that data so that you can see how changes in one area affect a change in another area. Uh, the reason that this sort of research matters, and as we further refine the tool and make it as user-friendly as possible, what you're going to do is put into the hands of policymakers or a policy community the opportunity to examine options that they might consider for policy, see potential results, see trade-offs between one choice or another choice, and with that, try to build up data-based or data-driven consensus for action in an environment that is otherwise prone to stagnation. And that's what we hope this model is able to develop over time. I want to see if there's any quick questions from the audience, and then we'll tee up our next panel discussion. Okay, then we'll move ahead with that, and please join me in thanking uh, Dennis Hoffman and his team who produced this. Mexican flag, red, white, and green. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon. We are going to start the last round of uh, discussions today. If you want to take your seats and move a little closer to the uh, stage, you're more than welcome to do so. Let me Welcome you once again. My name is Michael Wirtz. I work at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. I think uh, our last panel today is uh, going to discuss the missing link, so to speak. We are going to talk about transborder economic structures in greater granularity and greater precision because we want to move that discussion forward not only at an abstract political level, but we also want to figure out what are concrete measures in the practical world that uh, can be implemented and also answer the question, do they work or don't they work? Um, and what are the challenges? Um, Secretary Mead uh, earlier today has said there is nothing small that the United States and Mexico can do because even small changes have massive impact. And I thought that was a very good framing for the discussion that we are having here today. And um, the fact that um, we were able to drag so many people from Washington to Phoenix and to have a successful cooperation with the uh, McCain Center at least in the policy world, it shows you that trans-border activities and cooperation is actually possible. And so we're very grateful that we were able to do this. And we have a panel of uh, three specialists on trans-border and economic issues, and I will briefly introduce them in the order that they will make their introductory statements. And then we'll have a moderated conversation here on the panel, and obviously also interested in hearing from uh, you. Um, we'll start with Margie uh, Emmerman, who is the executive director of the Arizona-Mexico Commission. Um, she was appointed by the governor as a uh, policy advisor for Mexico and Latin America and the director of uh, the commission, AMC, in March of 2009. She has previously worked for and served other governors in the state, and she also served uh, under Governor Hull as a liaison to the Hispanic community in Arizona. And it is a great pleasure uh, to have you here and share your expertise and your thoughts with us. I will then ask James Allers to uh, comment. He is the general counsel and the vice president of legal affairs at Morel Morela Alvarez, which is a consulting firm. He's a Mexico policy analyst. He has uh, formerly been working for the uh, governor's office here in Arizona. And in his current firm and current position, he serves as the Mexico trade representative uh, for the city of Phoenix. And it's great that uh, you will be able to tell us in more and greater detail of what is happening in Phoenix and how Phoenix is structuring its transborder uh, cooperation with Mexican cities. Last but not least, Juan Pardinas is the director of the Mexican Institute for Competitiveness, IMCO. Uh, he's not only a former CNN correspondent in countries like Japan and India and an accomplished university professor that teaches at the uh, most exquisite institutions in Mexico, but he's also uh, somebody that uh, is not only an important economic analyst, but he also has the ear of uh, President Enrique Peña Nieto and is an important advisor to the current government. 
So um, I think we um, have, uh, can have the capacity with this panel to develop different perspectives on that issue. And I would also ask you in your introductory statements not only to be brief and give us food for thought, but also if, uh, if it makes sense from your perspective to tell us how this connects to the discussion that Bob Zellick, Secretary Mead, and Dandra Strapo have, uh, have put forth earlier. So uh, let me start with you. Thank you, Michael, and um, I want to certainly thank, again, the McCain Institute and the um, Center for American Progress also. Um, I think that our discussion at a local level connects very, very nicely to the discussion that was held earlier. Theirs was certainly a macro discussion that talked about all of the opportunities at a um, sort of, you know, the, the, the Mexico-United um, States um, relationship. And how the, how the state of Arizona, for example, the, the work that we're doing here connects to all of that is critical. Uh, we're a border state, and we have a lot of opportunities, and we have a lot of issues that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, I can tell you that through the work of the governor's office and the work of the organization that I oversee, we are, we are a 55-year strong organization called the Arizona-Mexico Commission that's a public-private organization, and we oversee work of 14 committees, um, and the work that is done through that is it runs the gamut of both issues and opportunities. Um, let, me, let me just delve a little bit into some of the issues. You can't have a border without having um, things like, like connecting um, the infrastructure from the United States and Mexico and making sure that it connects appropriately and properly. And the, t the discussion that was held about infrastructure and infrastructure development, it, it is something that we contribute to on a daily basis and the needs that we have in order to be a competitive um, state and, and part of a competitive region is critical. So I, I'm going to throw that thought out and I'd like to discuss it a little bit more as we go forward. Um, there are opportunities, or, or there are issues certainly in the areas that we deal in environment, water, a whole host of things. But I think one of the most important things that I want to talk about going forward in this dialogue are the opportunities. We are um, certainly a state that has economic opportunities. Mexico is our number one trading partner. It is 36% of the trade that we have on an annual basis of the exports. Um, Mexico makes up 36% of our exports. Last year, um, we saw a billion dollar increase in our exports with Mexico. And so if you look at what the secretary um, talked about, Mexico being the 14th largest economy in the world, and projections showing that by 2050, it could grow to be the eighth largest economy. What we um, in the state of Arizona are looking at, how can we make sure that we understand how to grow our export economy and how to take advantage of the fact that Mexico is going to be growing from a manufacturing perspective, from an outsourcing perspective, from an investment perspective, and from being able to source the growing middle class in Mexico. We have implemented quite a number of programs in the state of Arizona, roadmaps and other things to be able to take uh, um, care of that of that growing economy um, at a state level, and we are going to be opening a trade office in Mexico um, next month to be able to capitalize on all of that. So um, for opening comments, I can tell you that we there are issues that we deal with on a daily basis, but they are certainly outnumbered by the opportunities, um, and that's what we work on in the state of Arizona. Let me follow that up with a very brief question. Um, Dan Restrepo has uh, described uh, what we see as a depressing and frustrating lack of engagement with Mexico at a broader uh, a public environment in the United States. Uh, do you feel that people in Arizona are sufficiently engaged when you give these speeches uh, uh, to people in Arizona that are not necessarily involved in trans-border trade or do not know much about Mexico? Do you feel that you have buy-in or are there still challenges that need to be overcome? I think that it's a growing um, educational process. I can tell you that it's gotten better. Um, I've been doing this for state government now for 20 years. Um, when I first became the governor's policy advisor and executive director of the commission, there was a lonely little group of people that talked. Um, that group has certainly gotten larger. We have started engaging up communities at a broader level, the public and the private sector. Before it was Southern Arizona and the border communities and a couple of us that were here in Phoenix. 
now you have the mayor of Phoenix that's taking a really, really great leadership role, um, some of the other mayors. And so I'm seeing it growing. Is there room for opportunity? Absolutely. So I am so pleased to see that you're doing these outreach efforts to help us. There is still a lot of room for improvement. I don't think that the private sector has engaged as much as it needs to. I think that the public sector is getting better at it. As I said, the mayor's taking um, delegations. Um, I've worked for four governors now, and the governors are the chair of the Arizona-Mexico Commission and have done a great job in making sure that there's visibility through them chairing this and have always done trade delegations and other things to Mexico. It is growing, still a lot of room for improvement, but I am definitely seeing it getting better. Thank you very much. James, uh, if you go to Mexico and you say, hey, I'm the uh, trade representative for Mexico for the city of Phoenix, uh, what are the reactions? What do people say if you say, let's do business? Um, I think the, the reaction's uh, generally very positive. I think that the one of the uh, as Margie said, it's, it's a growing education process and that goes both ways. So um, the city of Phoenix uh, is getting uh, much more aggressive, and I use that word in a uh, positive sense, about promoting the relationship with Mexico and reaching out and making connections, direct connections with potential trade partners. So um, I think that there's perhaps not a lot of knowledge on, just as there's a lack of knowledge on this side about the opportunities uh, for trade and exchange with Mexico, there's a, la there's a lack of knowledge on the Mexican side about um, the type of uh, economic opportunities that Arizona offers because of some of the compatible uh, industry sectors that we have with Mexico. Um, I was actually in, uh, I was fortunate to be invited to represent the city of Phoenix at the America's Competitiveness Exchange uh, in this past August. And we went to a group of economic development professionals and entrepreneurs got to tour a number of innovation and entrepreneurship centers throughout Mexico. So we went to the two largest cities in Mexico, Mexico City and Guadalajara, Jalisco, and also to the much smaller city of uh, Aguas Calientes, Aguas Calientes, which is a city of about a million people. Uh, Interesting because they have basically no natural resource to speak of, but they've built a really strong economy in part based on a booming automotive sector. And just to give you a quick example, that uh, Renault and uh, Daimler have reached, or it's Renault Nissan, I believe, and Daimler have reached an agreement to do a joint venture to produce luxury Infiniti and Mercedes vehicles down there. That's not something that people in Arizona would be aware of as an opportunity, that there's a booming automotive sector in this small state sort of triangulated between the major centers of business in Mexico. So that is part of the uh, education process that we have to undergo in identifying those specific opportunities that are a good fit for Arizona. Can you quickly give us two or three examples where there was a successful initiative that you guys managed uh, between the city of Phoenix and partner organizations or, or regions or cities in Mexico, just to get a better idea what we're talking about? So one recent example is uh, working on increasing uh, air a service uh, between Mexico and Arizona. Uh, Volaris Airlines recently opened up service here. Unfortunately, Aeromexico recently uh, stopped service, so uh, we're, we're continuing to talk about how to beef that up, but um, that was an area where, you know, before Aeromexico had gone out, we worked on developing air service, which is obviously important for commerce in central and southern Mexico. Um, uh, there, I mean, there are a number of examples. Um, we've been reaching out to uh, the state of Querétaro. There was a trade mission uh, in which uh, uh, Mayor Stanton participated last March, um, and there's been uh, outreach to the state of Querétaro, which is an aerospace center. Um, those are a couple of examples off the top of my head. Great, thank you very much. Juan, let me uh, move over to you, and uh, we've talked a lot about the uh, U.S. perspective uh, north-south, uh, give us a little bit of a, of a feeling and, and a download of what, uh, how this reflects on the Mexican side. What are the great opportunities? What are the challenges? What's the Mexican perspective on all the issues that we've been discussing today? 
Thank you, Michael. I'm very grateful for your introduction. I, I'm not very sure if I'm like an advisor to President Peña, but <laughs> uh, my, my line of business in the, uh, it's I run a think tank and being uh, running a think tank, it's a bit like a baseball player. So sometimes you do your policy proposals and they reach first base, second base. Sometimes you get strikeouts and sometimes you get home runs. So that can, can give the, the, the impression that I, I, I work directly with government. It's an independent uh, think tank, but we, we are, uh, Actually, we're, we're very surprised if we have, have, have had this conversation a year and a half ago and someone would say, well, Mexico would have a, a, an energy reform of the scope that, that it just occurred. It would be a, a very, it would be a success of imagination over evidence because we have been, we discussed this for so long. Uh, and never happened, and suddenly we discuss it a little bit more, and it happened. That I think we, we Mexicans have earned, earned the right to to imagine and to imagine big things, and that uh, big things could happen, and big things could happen in in smaller projects on, or in smaller versions. And then I'm, I'm, that will take me to to my point in the border uh, as the. Uh, as Minister Mead was saying, that there are no small issues in the, bo in, bo in the border. And actually, my favorite projects in the border are what you could see uh, or interpret as a small issue, like a pedestrian bridge, for example. Between Tijuana and San Diego, they decided to build a pedestrian bridge to cross to the Tijuana airport. People in San Diego that wanted to travel to Asia, they had to go drive to, uh, to LA because the track on the airport was not big enough. The airport is landlocked by a Navy base, by a mountain, and by uh, 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 the sea. So now the Tijuana airport, with this very simple version of infrastructure, a pedestrian bridge, will manage to cross to Tijuana and be able to fly directly to Asia. That will increase the competitiveness of the whole area. Now, uh, San Diego will benefit of a larger uh, airport, more uh, airline communication with a very simple projects. How many pedestrian bridges like that? How many small initiatives like that that could transform the, the, uh, ec the economic of a region? could we think and we imagine in the future? I think the opportunities are huge. Uh, we have focused a bit the conversation between uh, s the partners of uh, sister, uh, cities between the two countries. And one problem we had in Mexico until this process of reform is that our majors lasted for three years with no possibility of reelection. Mexico was one of the few countries in the world where there was no re-election at any position in Congress, in state governments, in municipal governments. Uh, I was talking last uh, uh, year with some mayors in the US and I told him, what could you do with a three-year period with no possibility of re-election? And he told me, well, that's the average scope of time that will take me to know the, the path from my office to the, to the bathroom and finding just where to turn on the light and turn off the light, the switch in the wall. So for, from the perspective of the political system of the US at municipal level, at city level, at three years PAM, it's too short. For Mexico, that was a whole administration. That's all, it's also in a process of change because finally the Mexican Congress approved the right for uh, the Mexican citizens to re-elect or to fire its elected officials at city level. This will trigger, I think, huge opportunities for more long-term uh, interaction between the two countries from an urban perspective, which is a huge potential from the uh, perspective of the border. There are so, uh, so much infrastructure that we need not from a national level, not from the view of Mexico City or the view of Washington, but that we need in San Diego and Tijuana, that we need in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, for example, water treatment plants, 
why we could not imagine the possibility of two neighboring cities putting forward a, a financial mechanism to produce infrastructure that will benefit both sides of the border. Maybe that's hard to imagine now. It's a, it's, it's so, it seems too distant in the future. But so many things are happening that I think we should aim at, at the long term, how, how, how this re, uh, relation with evolve. Why not imagine, for example, the Caltrain in California reaching a, a station in Tijuana uh, with an easier bo border crossing? There are so many things that could happen between our two countries, and I think it's a very auspicious time uh, to, to imagine and to debate the possibilities. When you mentioned these creative ideas with Mexican leadership, and I just said this because the last two times I tried to meet you in Mexico, the officer always said he is uh, at Los Pinos talking to Enrique <laughs> Peña Nieto. That's why I thought he is actually listening to you, which <laughs> would be a good thing. So if you talk to Mexican political leadership about these creative ideas, what reaction do you get? Do people say, this is fantastic, Juan, let's do it? Do they say, we don't really know about the gringos, we should be careful? Or, or are people saying there are a lot of technical, logistical, and political challenges, we have to take it step by step, step and be careful? What is, the, what is the atmosphere that's surrounding these discussions? I think there's a sense of possibility in Mexico that was not there before two years ago. Uh, there are some irrealistic ir possibilities and there are some realistic possibilities, but some things we should aim to. For example, there's a, a, a big telecom entrepreneur in Africa, he's called Mo Ibrahim. The guy managed to put 12 countries in a single uh, international uh, code for, for telephones. Why? not imagining Mexico joining the, uh, the telephone uh, area code in the US. That would save so much money for so many consumers from the Mexican side. Maybe it's a small idea, but it would worth millions of dollars saved in the pockets of people in bro both sides uh, of the country. There was even some idea that it would, be, uh, it would sound more crazy in the present context. Someone, someone put it forward in Washington, uh, a North American passport. If I have my global entry, if I have my Mexican passport, if, if I have a Canadian visa, maybe I could achieve uh, a for a different document that will recognize me not only as a Mexican citizen, but as a citizen of North America. Uh, it's hard to see now, but it was even harder to see for any Mexican the possibility of a major energy reform. So we are kind of uh, uh, inspired by, by the wrong success of what is happening. Maybe we, we need to sober up uh, in the future seeing the complexities of enforcing these reforms. But I think it's, it's time to, to dare and time to, to think big. Big Thank and small at the same time. Thank you. James, you have mentioned uh, the integration of the uh, aeronautical uh, markets in North America. Um, when we were preparing for this event, uh, we went to Mexico, we spoke to a number of uh, business representatives, among them Andres Conesa, who is the CEO of Aeromexico, and you have mentioned that Aeromexico stopped flying to, uh, to Phoenix uh, uh, in the aftermath of, of legislative changes. What he said was something really interesting. He said, I want to be the CEO of a North American airline and I don't really make most of my money with uh, um, business class travelers from New York that want to use their frequent traveler miles all the time. I make money with uh, people that, uh, that move between Mexico and the United States and pay economy class tickets because people work on both sides of the border. Um, so, th at the same time, we have a tremendous step forward. If we look what has happened, see what has happened in Querétaro, as you mentioned, GE has almost a thousand engineers there building aircraft turbines. Uh, Aeromexico is servicing over half of uh, Delta's narrow-bodied aircrafts, something that nobody knows in the United States, f uh, maybe for a good reason, but still. Uh, so, d w how do we, is, are these like, temporary road bumps, how do we overcome the fact that we have sometimes divergent political processes going on? How do we make sure that the bigger picture is actually what defines our, our, our narratives in which we talk about the future of the United States and, and Mexico maybe five or ten years from now? So I, I actually take a more micro view, I guess. I'm not sure that the big picture does define the the progress forward. Um, I don't know the economics of the Aeromexico decision, 
but for instance, um, with Bolaris, I mean, that was a, an opportunity that came about because there was a targeted effort made to attract them to Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport and a personal connection was made. And I think a lot of what is accomplished through some of the initiatives that Margie mentioned um, and you know, with, with respect to some of the more visionary initiatives that Juan's talking about is done through personal connections. And I think um, the, the trust factor between the individuals uh, builds a larger trust factor that makes uh, trade and exchange possible. But I, I don't know if, um, I guess from my perspective, the accumulation of those individual opportunities um, sort of creates the macro picture rather than targeting a sort of macro end and um, setting out to pursue opportunities that fit that, that goal. Um, Margie, you have been in your one of your previous political positions uh, working as a liaison vis-a-vis -vis the Hispanic community here in the region. Um, to which degree is, is, uh, is the Hispanic community uh, part, an integral part of the initiatives that, that you've outlined? Could you give us a few examples where uh, members of the Hispanic community or the Mexican-American community have been driving forces in, in the initiatives that you have put forward? Well, in Arizona, it's kind of hard not to have the Hispanic community involved because the Hispanic community is becoming a larger part of the um, fabric of the community. We, we are a large percentage. Um, I can tell you that through the um, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and we have um, somebody here that's very involved with it, Mr. Astorga, um, there has been a lot of progress made on having a Mexico platform to engage and involve people in the Latino community. And any of our trade missions that have been done um, recently, the head of the Hispanic Chamber has been very involved in going, to tr going on trade missions, and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has a platform for that. So Mexico is an integral part of it. In Tucson, the um, Chamber has a, a very, very strong outreach effort to um, the state of Sonora, and they have a person that is assigned in um, Hermosillo that does um, outreach for the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in the state of Sonora. So I think Latinos are becoming very, very engaged in trade, very engaged in the Mexico trade, and they, they are no different than any um, entrepreneur or anybody that's wanting to um, increase competitiveness. They're, they are a part of, um, of the business community. Following up on, on, on this uh, very rich description, um, there's a Mexican author by the name of uh, Ricardo Rafael who has written a memorable book which is called Borderlands. And his argument after spending considerable time south of the border and now the complementary research that he is doing is north of the border, his argument is um, the borderlands north and south of the border is actually where the future of North America is happening basically arguing the border is not something that divides us, but, but, but a connector between two countries. From your concrete experience, would you, would you agree with such a thesis? Are there, are there little first perspectives that you could describe that actually the border region between Mexico and the United States is developing so into something that is actually connecting our two countries? You know, having lived in the border all of my life, if you consider the border, I mean, it's the, it's the gateway. It's, it's, it's the first point of entry, um, whether you're going to Mexico or coming into the United States. And a lot of the competitiveness and a lot of the work that is happening to really increase our trade opportunities, um, I mean, that, that is sort of the, the ground zero to me. I mean, that, that's really where a lot of the things get piloted, a lot of the things get done, a lot of the infrastructure development happens. So I think that it is a great place for people to understand a bilateral relationship. That's sort of where you have people that truly understand each other's point of view because people um, are going back and forth and connecting. So to me, it, it is really, it's ground zero. It's where you understand um, two different cultures. It's where two different cultures come together. So, so I, I, having been a border person and having, and having lived here, um, truly do, uh, do believe that, that, that it is how two um, sort of two different cultures and two different countries come together is there. Thank you. Juan, would you agree with this description or is it from a Mexican perspective still 
so far from God, so close to the United States. No, I, I never agree with such saying. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, the future the, of the relationship between the, the two countries starts here in the border, and there are so much opportunities to improve the relation from the border perspective, or, or other kind of diplomatic approaches, I would say. I, I think it's very auspicious that we are having this conversation in the ca campus of the uh, uh, Arizona State University, because uh, the model they are doing of academic diplomacy, of opening uh, office in Mexico City, representing the university itself. I think if you see the relation between the two countries, the commercial, the trade, the demographics, we are partners in a very high ranking of all these issues you see, no? demographics, economics, but if you see the amount, the exchange of students, for example, we are we rank very low. In that regard, the interaction does not reflect the possibility, the potential that the relations between the two countries have. Uh, a country like Vietnam, for example, has more foreign students in the U.S. than Mexico. I get, don't have anything against Vietnam, but it's quite far away. It's uh, ge geographically, it's very obvious the reason that. That, that that's not rational. There are so many opportunities to improve the interaction, and I also think to, to improve the interaction in the border, the, the need for investment in infrastructure, at least from the Mexico side, it's enormous to make that interaction easier, softer, happier. Uh, one lady was telling me once, that her mother, uh, they, they lived in Tijuana, they, she liked to, to wash their clothes in the US side because she said that the quality of the water was better. So every week she crossed the border to wash, to, to do the washing here and then she came back. I, I would love to see that kind of interaction in, in a more different level that you don't consider you are crossing the, a different country, you are just going to the other side because the washing is better. And, and it reflected the border that was much more easier to cross than what we have now. Uh, the demographics have changed, we have a much more interaction and I don't think the infrastructure reflects uh, the, the, the growth in both sides uh, of the border. So. I think we, we need to invest much more. I would like to see uh, a more visionary approach from Washington and Mexico City on, on the need to, to increase the quality of the relationship f starting from the border. Yeah, thank you. And obviously, given the quality of clothing in the United States, it's so good because so much of it is made in Mexico. So <laughs> Mexicans are always welcome to spend their hard-earned pesos in, in the United States, I guess. James, I have one further question for you. We have heard today that uh, there is, uh, there is uh, travel of U go U.S. governors towards Mexico like never before. Uh, basically, every single month, the Mexico, Mexican government is receiving a high-level visit, Chris Christie being uh, the last of them. If you uh, talk to your Mexican interlocutors, it seems that they have a fairly broad bandwidth of options of cooperating. Um, what are your selling points? Why is this does it make more sense for them to work with you here in Arizona in the city of Phoenix than with New Jersey or California or, or your other competitors on the US side? How does that play out? Well, that's a, a sales job that uh, we have to do. And uh, there are a number of economic advantages uh, to doing trade and investment with Arizona as opposed to other locations. It's relatively cheaper. Um, we have generally been ranked by a lot of business intelligence entities like Forbes and so forth as one of the best entrepreneurship and startup markets in the country. Um, you know, California is generally regarded as the hub of that kind of activity, but it's extremely expensive to do business in California. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives at the city and state level to make it a less cumbersome regulatory environment, and I think that that's an important selling point. Uh, there's a, a cultural uh, affinity between Arizona and Mexico, for instance, that doesn't exist as much with like a New Jersey, a Chicago, certainly there's a huge Mexican population there, but um, 
And going back to the the point about the presence of Latinos in Phoenix and how that connects with business opportunities in Mexico, I think there's a huge opportunity to promote entrepreneurship uh, and innovation, joint efforts in that regard, in part because of the presence of the Latino population. There's a huge entrepreneurial spirit uh, in the Latino community, a lot of small and medium-sized businesses. And there have been discussions, for example, with the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce uh, and Secretary Mead about the possibility of a recognition or some kind of competition for entrepreneurship and innovation um, for Mexican national entrepreneurs in the United States. So those are areas where I think we have to do a better selling job of you know, what is Arizona about and what do we have to offer. Is this only happening on the state to state or state to region level or are you also looking into southwestern regional cooperation vis-a-vis -vis Mexico to broaden the scope and maybe be more attractive for potential partners down south? So cooperation between, say, Arizona and Texas and California directed. There is, um, there is some of that cooperation uh, through, for instance, the Border Governors Conference and Margie can speak more about that, but, um, but uh, the Border Governors Conference brings together the 10 uh, U.S.-Mexico border governors. And there's a lot of cooperation on issues of common concern, environmental issues, security issues, uh, infrastructure issues. In terms of presenting the Southwest market as a general target for Mexico, um, I've heard that discussed sort of in uh, venture capital circles about the possibility of developing something of that kind, but I'm not aware of any concerted effort to do that as yet. Margie, would you be able to comment on this as well? And maybe given your, your in-depth experience over a relatively long time period as representative of the governors of Arizona, give us a little bit of a feeling of what has changed qualita qualitatively. If you look back 10, 15, or 20 years, you have, uh, you have referred to that in your earlier statements, but maybe with a few examples just to better understand uh, to which degree there's an entirely new dynamic that makes a qualitative difference in how we deal uh, with transborder economic and political affairs? So um, a lot of the discussions in the past were, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to? Um, so let me just give you a concrete example of how we are now implementing some of the things that we used to just talk about. Um, we've always said, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we had the things that, that um, the previous panel was talking about, and it was sort of the um, the North American integration. And we do it at, at a much more regional level. And, and, and so we talk about Arizona and Sonora, or Arizona and Sonora and Sinaloa, and we're branching it out to have more of this, you know, this competitive um, corridor. But let me just talk about Arizona and Sonora first, because that's where we've made a lot of progress. Um, so when we talk about not just Arizona competing against everybody else, but a true binational region. And um, unfortunately, the trip had to be canceled because of the problems that Israel was experiencing, security problems that Israel was experiencing recently. But we actually had a trip where our governor, Governor Brewer, and Governor Padres in Sonora were going to go and jointly promote Arizona and Sonora as a binational region to, um, to um, talk to companies from Israel to come and relocate in our region um, and do business with our region so that they could do their R&D in Arizona, manufacturing in Sonora. These are things that in the past, you wouldn't have seen a governor from Arizona and a governor from Sonora jointly going to Israel to promote um, manufacturing in one state and R&D in another state. So when, when we talk about jointly promoting regions, um, that's something that I can say is a tangible, uh, progress from before to have two nations going to jointly promote a region. And there are, there are things that we're doing constantly. Our agency directors in our state agencies are continually working with their counterparts in Mexico um, and making revolutionary breaking memorandums of understanding that in the past you would have never seen, first of a kind, never seen before. And so I can tell you that in the past the dialogue was, wouldn't it be nice to? And now we're constantly looking for, we want to be the first to ever do X.
Do you explicitly call it a binational region or, or do you find different wording? Because I could, would assume that on the Mexican and the American side that touches upon political sensitivities possibly. You know, it used to touch on political mm -hmm. sensitivities and before we used to have to like, you know, to call it something else and we'd, we'd, you know, dance around the table and we'd figure out other words. And now we're calling it, you know, the Arizona Sonata region. So we, we have gotten a little bit bolder in the way that we talk about it. And, um, and we, we we're just trying to figure out a way to have people understand that, um, yes, there is a border, and yes, we have to be sensitive about it, but we also know that regions are broader than just um, bound by geographic um, distinction. And so we, we say the Arizona Sonora region when we talk about work that we're doing in conjunction with our border state. Juan, is that something that is being discussed in, in Mexico in a, in a similar perspective? Well, uh, I think it, it sends a very uh, optimistic signal. When, when you need to search for new words, for new concepts, for new terms, it means that reality is evolving. If you need to search from a binational relationship and then try to find out, well, it's the Arizona Sonora region. And in a way, the, the message it compels, Hill, it's like maybe we, our relation, it's as could be as potentially relevant as the fact that we belong to different countries. But as a region, we could compete, we could be better partners, we could approach Israel in a more competitive way that if the governor of Sonora went by himself of the, or the governor of Arizona. And, and, and I think that uh, example sends a very potential message to the two countries that we are much more competitive as a region than separate by itself. Uh, two, uh, two years ago or so, uh, President Obama launched the initiative that the U.S. needed uh, need to double its manufacturing exports by 2018, I think it was the goal he set. I'm sure that that goal could be much more easily achieved if it was, if it was launched as a North American initiative than a, a U.S. initiative. So uh, I, I'm very glad that Arizona and Sonora and are sending the example of how we should see the region. Uh, we would be uh, uh, in the uh, panel this morning, the, the example of China was put forward. And I, I think we, it would be much more easier for our two countries to face the challenges of competing to with China as a region than, than as a national entities itself, from a de demographical perspective, from a financial perspective, from a bilingual perspective. There is so much potential we, we could achieve if we start approaching problems with, uh, with a different scope, with a different perspective. And, uh, and I think that should be more regional and less national perspective. I, th I think that is a very interesting dimension of, of the conversation. And I'd like to uh, bring in Agustin Barrios Gomez, who is here in the audience. He's a member of the Mexican Congress representing one of the central districts of Mexico City. And Augustine, if you could just share a few thoughts or descriptions with us of how does this play out on the floor of the Mexican Congress, where you have a strong tradition of national integrity, um, a, a, a little bit of ambiguity vis-a-vis -vis the United States, um, and then you have these discussions which are absolutely transcending the political categories within which we have been traditionally discussing the relationship. Is this difficult? Are there, are there major challenges? Or would you agree with what seems to be consensus on the panel that this is really a process that is going on and is almost impossible to reverse? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, Thank whenever, you. whenever I talk about North America in general and uh, Mexico in particular, in the United States, um, I'm reminded of the motto of the of the British newspaper, The Economist, right, uh, which seeks to take part in a severe contest between intelligence, which presses forward, and an unworthy, timid ignorance obstructing our progress. Um, and the ignorance is on both sides of the border, certainly. Um, on the U.S. House of Representatives and in San Lázaro at the Palacio este, Legislativo de San Lázaro, in, in, which is our House of Representatives. Um, it depends on which side of the, of the floor you're on in terms of Mexico's Congress. The, uh, the, the right side has basically 
um, uh, transcended many of the old uh, bêtes noires of, 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 of the discussion and uh, transcended uh, revolutionary nationalism, which is basically no, is the nacionalismo revolucionario, which, which gave birth to the PRI and, and eventually is very much the standard that, that, that my party or the party that, that put me on the ballot, the PRD, has, has, has taken as its own. So a lot of people have transcended that. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the representatives, even on the left, um, who are in tune with migrant communities in the United States because there has been an outreach, very, very, very much too limited in my, in my view, but there has been an outreach. Um, that sector of the left has also transcended many of the old, um, and many of the old uh, ghosts or, 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 or um, issues that, uh, that, that used to, you know, taint everything that, 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 was, that, was, that was the United States for, for, for Mexicans. Um, having said that, both the DF and DC, right? DC on this side, DF on our side, um, don't really understand the border. So if, if the issue is the border, you have the most cross-border in the world, you have $500 billion worth of commerce going on uh, through that border, you have the, the, the most important inland port in the United States being Laredo with $270 billion worth of trade. Just at that point, it is more important than, than Windsor, um, uh, Windsor, Detroit. Um, and, and so this is the reality. It's not, it's not about potential, it's about what already happened. And by the way, on both sides, the demographic growth is actually faster than in their respective countries. So people are deciding to move to the border region on both sides. Um, and so it, it, it's the sort of thing that, that I, I, I like to say that history happened to North America, right? We didn't shape it, it just happened. And so Mexico City and the United States and, 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 and Washington are constantly trying to catch up with the reality on the ground. And um, one of the things, you know, here you have, like, for example, uh, France and Germany, which actually made a conscious decision to really integrate and, and, and all of these things. But you look at the exchanges between Mexico and the United States, and they are order of magnitude more important than anything that's going on in Europe. And, and, and Europe has put some of its best minds for the last, and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars behind their project. And here we are with a reality that's much more that's much more intense because it's not just 35 million Mexicans and Mexican Americans, of which, by the way, more than 80 percent are either U.S. citizens or legal residents. So, such that the Mexican experience in the United States is not an experience of undocumented um, existence. It is an experience that goes back much, much further, and is much more intense as, uh, uh, than than people realize. Um, but the the but here it's been done without. The, the participation of the elites. It's been done by people choosing to actually, you know, to actually do this, to actually be there. And you go to McAllen, and of course, and it turns out that the McAllen Mall, which is actually no prize, is, uh, it turns out that, that it has the highest, the highest sales per square foot of any mall in the United States, McAllen. Um, so it's not the Mall of the Americas, you know, it's not, it's not, so, that's the reality, and so the reality is constantly moving beyond what what our two capitals are are aware of. Now, it's really funny for those of us who have actually been involved in this relationship for so many years. I went to Georgetown, and I interned at the CSIS with Dalal Bear, and we did you know we 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 created this NAFTA summit in 1993, um, where we had 28 members of Congress in, in, in on Capitol Hill come to it and the whole thing, and the. And the issue was, you know, how the, one of the bigger issues was how the Mexican people were going to take this, right? Because it, it was assumed. And now a lot, of the, a lot of the issues are actually, you know, here in the United States with respect to how, how, how the conventional wisdom, which is where we really need to get to. We need to get to that conventional wisdom. We need to, we need to speak with them, uh, to them in, 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 in about truths, right? And it's funny to see how everything like that has changed. Este Juan and, and Alexandra this morning when we were at breakfast, um, they, were, they were saying how a year ago the, the reforms hadn't gone, you know, the reforms in, in Mexico, the energy reforms, and I think you just mentioned this one, they, it was a volte face, right? They an incomplete about face in terms of what was possible, and this was merely a year ago. Um, so with respect to the economic relationship, it's very real. 
the, the demographic relationship is extremely real. I would actually venture to say, I mean, I'm an international relations major, and I've lived in Europe, and I've lived in, in Canada, and not all these different countries, so it's not just a, you know, a myopic fo focus on, on, on US-Mexico. I would say that the most important relationship between two major countries on the planet is that between Mexico and the United States. And to, that, to those 35 million uh, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans in the United States, you have to add the fact that there, at any given time, there's between one and three million Americans in Mexico, which is between four and 12 times more than the second most important recipient of US migration, which is Canada. Order of magnitude, I keep saying that word, and it's uh, the, the most important or the largest consular relation, the largest consular presence of any country anywhere is Mexico's in the United States. And guess what, the only place that every single U.S. government dependency is represented is Mexico City, the only place outside of Washington, D.C. that every single U.S. government dependency is, in rep is represented is in Mexico City. So that speaks to the fact that our governments are aware of this, and they're actually reacting to it, but it's sort of a very well-kept secret, right? And it functions on its own, and it speaks to the strength of the relationship that it is not affected by, th by the day-to-day um, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day issues that's, that, that, that arise. So that's Great. a long answer to your question. Thank you very much, Augustine. Uh, uh, I, I think we do ev we're going to do everything we can to make that well-kept secret uh, public. But uh, let me open it up uh, for, uh, for uh, interventions and questions and suggestions from the audience. Uh, gentleman over here. If you briefly introduce yourself, we'd appreciate it. So my name is Kerry Kelly. I work at the Siegman Institute. I'm also an undergraduate student here at Arizona State University. Um, I actually wanted to speak to um, how, we, how we move popular sentiment in, in the favor of this binational relationship, especially because I, I spent the summer in Mexico City um, and talking with a lot of people, there's still a lot of, of, of skepticism um, and suspicion about the U.S.-Mexico relationship, and especially a lot of it is based in historical facts. So if you go to the, the big castle in the middle of Mexico City, it talks about what we know as the Mexican-American War, and there it's the U.S. invasion in Mexico. Um, and there's, there's a lot of this historical uh, relationship that I feel like creates a lot of public opinion still that we don't talk about in a lot of our dialogue. So I wanted to, to bring up the question of how we look at our historical relationship and reconcile that in the light of moving forward together. Great. Uh, very good point. Who uh, volunteers one would you like to comment on that? So we, we have uh, alternatives for the future, but we don't have any alternatives to the past. Uh, I, I think we, we have to, the, the history will always be there, but we have to look at the potential. And I think Agustin said something very important. The, our relation, it's a huge commercial and demographic success without a political narrative. Uh, if you go to DC, NAFTA, it's a four letter word. They, politicians there from both sides of the aisle, they, they don't want to use it. They feel uncomfortable if you bring it on. The, the high level summit between the three presidents of North America, the last one occurred in Toluca. And one of when I was reading the press release of the achievements of the summit, one of the issues was creating a safe pass for the monarch butterfly that runs from Canada through the US to Mexico. And I went like, come on, guys. You have the three heads of the state for the three <laughs> Nothing against the butterflies, please. But I think our, our relation should be a bit more ambitious than uh, safe passage for the butterfly. O obviously, that, that should be addressed, but maybe not with the three heads of state at the table. That was one of the achievements that was put forward on the press. And that shows that, well, our political leaders are not the best representatives of the relation in, in uh, I, I, and I would, I would say that from, from, from the Mexican side. I, I really like uh, Obama's, uh, President Obama's speech in Mexico City, uh, I think it was May last uh, year, but he gave that speech in Mexico City, it would have been impossible for him to quote a bit parts of that speech in Washington DC because the, 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 this success of our, the, the, this very successful relationship in commercial terms does not have a political narrative that goes along 
uh, with it, and we we need to build it. So far, the best uh, narratives I have heard about NAFTA does not come from politicians. Well, uh, Agustin here is an exception, uh, <laughs> a Mexican politician. It comes from CEOs of companies that are doing business between the two countries. And uh, if you go with the CEO of Honeywell and you tell me, could you imagine your company success without the relation between the two countries? No, it would be impossible. If you talk with the CEO of UPS, that they have a very clear measure of the amount of, of packages going for back and forward, they, they have the perfect message to convey what is happening between the two countries. Sadly, that's that narrative does not have a political uh, uh, reflection, and I, I think we need to build it. Th Thank you very much. Uh, please, over here. Good afternoon, Paola Garcia. I was very pleased to learn from Margie Emmerman about this new uh, joint advertisement of the, the region. And as a brief comment, I used to work for the Council for Economic Development in Sonora helping the soft landing of foreign enterprises at the state. One of our strongest assets was our proximity to Arizona, the largest market, the US. Now, if Arizona partners with Arizona saying, well, you can do R&D here and manufacture in Sonora, and eventually we move to a bilateral promotion in, in shops and in trade shops that will actually bring companies, I can totally see another era in this bilateral collaboration. Great news. And maybe uh, extending this notion, so where do you see this relationship go in an optimistic scenario five or 10 years from now, given the changes that you have seen in the past? Is this irreversible, or could you envision a situation where in Mexico and the United States public opinion makes it much harder for you to talk about regions, binational offers to en enhance competitiveness on and trade, or are we really on a, on a gliding path that is very, very hard to, to turn back? I think that now that, that we have more people um, that are engaged in the dialogue, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to, to turn back. First of all, the economy of Mexico is very strong and growing. You have a lot more people engaged in the dialogue. It's a great opportunity, and it just gets a little bit harder to turn back from that. Um, we in Arizona have a goal that is um, similar to the, to the president's goal. Um, our goal, though, is to double trade with um, global markets by 2025, and ours was a two-way trade goal. It wasn't just to double our exports, but to double two-way trade. And um, w so, so we recognize that in order for us to be successful, it can't be just saying, we're going to double our exports and we don't care about anybody else. We understand that two-way trade is critically important. Um, the other thing that we're doing is when, when we look at, um, at what, what our opportunities are, we recognize that l having a, a strong trading partner and having a strong, um, complete corridor um, is, is, to us, our corridor starts in Mexico City and ends in Canada. It isn't just the Arizona piece of it that's important to us. So we're already thinking beyond just Arizona. Our partners are beyond the state of Arizona. Our partners are in, in the states in Mexico that are our competitive advantage states to make the region a stronger region. And when we say we want to be successful, we want the people on the Mexican side and on the Arizona side to increase job competitiveness and grow jobs and increase the quality of life. So I, I think that the mentality on the Arizona side, and is it everybody? No, and are we working on it? Yes. But I think that we, we are to a point where it would be a little bit difficult to turn away from. Great. James. Michael, if I can piggyback on that. Um, I think that whether or not the forward trajectory of the relationship stalls or moves backwards is really up to us. Um, I think we need to do a much better job of telling the success stories of the uh, US and Arizona-Mexico relationship and change the dialogue. And I think it's also going to be a general or generational shift over a long term. Um, Juan talked about the lack of university uh, exchange, student exchange. I think that as that changes, people's perceptions will change through experience. Um, me personally, my six-year-old son is in a 
uh, bilingual uh, preschool <laughs> learning Spanish. So I think you know there's a, a generation coming that will just see this exchange as normal, and it, it will and that will keep the relationship moving forward. Great, thank you very much. So we're going to take one last intervention. Of the lady to the back. There's a microphone for you. I am a business owner, and I just would like to ask about tourism. I think that the touristic uh, sector in Mexico has been suffering a lot, and it's because of the perception of the average U.S. citizen, you know, through the media. How do you perceive Mexico? Safe, pretty, clean, or, you know, the way it shows in media. Um, the other question that I have, we are in the journalism and mass communication um, faculty. Were the students invited? Because those are the ones that are gonna say the study, you know, the, the story in the news in the future, and I don't see them here. <laughs> so I just would like to see if they were invited and how the Secretaria de Turismo is doing to improve and also change the uh, perception that the average U.S. citizen has through the media. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, all the students were invited. This is a public event. We have tried as as good as we as well as we could to announce it uh, publicly. So uh, if they're not here, it's uh, it's not the organizer's fault. Um, Paris, we're going to take one last uh, intervention from uh, from Augustine, and then I'll give the panelists to uh, the opportunity to wrap up with their last the, comments. The, the thing is, I'm on I'm uh, I'm secretary of the tourism committee and in, in the Mexican Congress. So uh, we, we are the ones who fund Sector and the whole thing. Um, Mexican tourism, uh, we, are the, we are the 13th right now, largest um, uh, tourism destination. We actually, that's coming down from number seven. We were the seventh most important tourism destination in the world a few years ago. Now we're number 14th. We haven't actually shrunk, even though uh, the effects of H1N1 in 2009 and um, and a lot of the bad press that we received because of uh, because of uh, the uh, the narco violence that happened in certain parts of the country um, did affect our tourism receipts. But we are still receiving about 26, 27 million uh, foreign tourists per year. Um, what are we doing about it? We are growing. We are growing at. Uh, we we have retaken growth. At the end of the day, we st we do remain the the number one by far number one tourist destination for the United States by far. Um, that the, and what we found is that people who come to Mexico, um, eight out of ten uh, v foreign visitors who visit Mexico um, want to return. So it's a question of it, 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 it's a question of reaching the the people who d haven't come to Mexico. So it's it's not a, it, the people who have come to Mexico are coming back, um, but the people who who um, who we have yet to outreach to. Um, need to need to start coming down to Mexico. So that's basically what's going on. And the budget, by the by the way, is at historical highs for promotion promoting Mexico, which is a little bit different than brand Mexico. There's a difference between promoting your destinations as destinations and uh, promoting Mexico's image abroad. Great, thank you very much. Let me uh, uh, give our panelists uh, a chance for a very brief last intervention and ask you what is going to be your the number one issue that you'll be dealing with in 2015 with regard to the themes that we have discussed here. Margie, let's start with you. So, um, first of all, um, since this is gonna be the last time I get to talk, I do wanna again thank the McCain Institute and the Center for um, American Progress for doing this. I think it's critically important. Our number one issue in 2015 is going to be that Arizona is going to have a, a new governor, so it's going to be uh, a new administration, um, and just that change in, um, in government is going to um, make sure that we continue um, the great work that the state of Arizona has done with Mexico and to make sure that the trade office that we are opening um, has the opportunity to um, increase our competitiveness and um, to continue um, the great relationship that we have with Mexico. But I think number one, new administration and to just um, have the continuity for the, um, the work that's being done with Mexico. And just to be sure, the trade office that you're speaking about is one that Arizona opens in Mexico. Arizona, in October, Arizona will have an opening, grand opening of a trade office in Mexico. And so that's, that's one of the things that we wanna have a strong continue our strong trade relationship with Mexico, have that trade office um, that we're doing in collaboration with um, the city of Phoenix be really, really strong, and that the new governor um, and the new administration just continue the work that 
um, that has been done with Mexico, which I, I mean, I, I'm pretty confident that's going to happen, but that, it, that there's a lot of work that's been put in place on, in the infrastructure front, the economic development front, and, and a lot of other ways that, you know, that a transitional governor continues and enhances it, um, and that there's a lot of focused attention being placed on Mexico. Thank you. James, what is going to be your major concern in 2015 besides your six-year-old son? <laughs> Um, our main uh, focus is going to be export readiness. There are, we're already working with uh, the Arizona Commerce Authority and the U.S. Commercial Service to uh, help companies leverage the resources that they have to become export ready, to understand the regulatory issues involved and so forth. But they at times have difficulty getting companies to participate. So I think that uh, telling the story about the opportunities that are available in Mexico and advanced manufacturing and biotech and renewable energy and all those sectors uh, and attracting companies from the greater Phoenix area and from Arizona to participate in that training and start actually exporting uh, is a big focal point. Thank you. Juan, uh, next year is going to be the halftime mark for Enrique Peña Nieto's sexenio, his uh, presidency. What are going to be the major issues for you? I, I think we, we should move uh, our binational agenda from uh, butterflies and cliches to pragmatism for prosperity. And that uh, pragmatism needs to have like a minimalist approach with maximum consequences. And I would close with one anecdote. I was uh, four months ago in Birmingham, Alabama in a, in a car manufacturing plant by, uh, by Honda and they receive a lot of auto parts from uh, Mexico, and the auto parts came in, in plastic containers. Each auto part have a special plastic container, but the plastic containers were, were made in China, so they were not part of the free trade agreement between Mexico and the US, so every time the, the, the plastic containers had to return to Mexico, they had to be, they were, trapped at the customs because there were empty containers that they, on the Mexican side they needed to fill it with auto parts and send it back uh, to the Honda plant. Uh, and when I was uh, talking to the procurement chief of the Honda plant, he told me these plastic containers are the biggest pain in the neck I have. Uh, and he said, well, I think as a country, as two countries, we need to achieve something to solve the problem of the plastic containers. That will improve the productivity of uh, a very relevant car manufacturing company in, in, in the south of the US. Will improve the uh, trade between the two countries. And thinking of pedestrian bridges of, and plastic containers, I just wonder of the amount of opportunities are there for us to achieve. Thank you very much, but it's, it's, it's obviously a step-by-step -step process from butterflies to plastic containers, maybe then to real issues. Before we recognize the, the panelists, let me ask uh, Governor Strickland and Ambassador uh, Volker to come up to the stage for very brief closing remarks so we have an, uh, an adequate end to this uh, amazing day of discussions. Well, it's been a, a wonderful day, and uh, I'm going to say thank you to the McCain Institute and to Arizona State University for being such gracious hosts, um, and the Center for American Progress is uh, proud and pleased to have been a part of this effort, this ongoing effort. Um, I think we've talked uh, and touched on a lot of things today. Um, what I have thought as I've sat and listened is that we have two great countries uh, both should be doing what is in their self-interest. And what is in their self-interest is to recognize the, this important relationship and work to advance it, uh, whether it's infrastructure or climate or energy, um, educational exchanges, trade, manufacturing, on and on and on. There is so much that ties our two countries uh, together. Uh, we've talked some about public perception within each of the countries. And we've talked about the changing demographics and the fact that changing demographics will disrupt the status quo, which can be very good if it is managed uh, correctly. We have two countries that have shared values. 
but similar problems across a range of issues. We've talked about the media and the false impression that is um, oftentimes given um, uh, about both countries. Um, we have talked about uh, how we can be stronger together than we can be uh, separately. Um, I was especially struck by the statement that uh, North American history just happened, but now we have the opportunity to work together to shape the future. Um, anxieties will result from the demographic changes that are taking place. And as, some, as someone said on the panel, they must be dealt with and should be dealt with in a sensitive manner. How can we expand the conversation between uh, our two countries and the populations within our two countries? Um, I suspect that young Mexican citizens and young American citizens are perhaps, perhaps uh, less threatened by these demographic changes. And uh, that reminds me of the lyrics of the song that Bob Dylan wrote some years ago. Come mothers and fathers all over our lands and don't criticize what you can't understand. The times, they are a changing. And so uh, we should be shaping the future together. This is a wonderful beginning and uh, I just appreciate the opportunity of having been here and listened to these wonderful panel members uh, and the insights they've shared. And um, as I said, this is the beginning. Uh, and we hope that it will result in a much closer uh, relationship between two great countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor. And thank you, Michael, for your excellent job chairing this discussion as well. I'll leave with one thought from me, which is putting this into the context of American foreign policy. It's what we talked about throughout the day. Uh, I think there are three principles that have to be at the rock bottom of American foreign policy. That we have to act in accordance with our values. That the United States needs to lead in the world. No one else can do it if we don't. And that we need to invest in our own sources of strength. And what we've talked about today is consistent with those three principles. And there are two kinds of issues when you orient yourself and look at the world that way. There are long-term investments to shape the world we're gonna live in, and there are crises that need management because otherwise they're gonna shape the world instead. We have some crises. We have ISIS, we have Russia invading Georgia, we have uh, China's military growing, we have an Iran nuclear issue, but we also have opportunities for investment. And one of those is our relationship with Mexico, and we shouldn't fail to make that investment. So with that, let me say thank you on behalf of the McCain Institute, on behalf of President Crow and Arizona State University, and let me turn it back to Michael to wrap up. And thank you all of you for coming. Thank you very much. Nothing, nothing more to add than a sincere thank to our fantastic panelists. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here.